Almighty God, who in thy infinite wisdom and providential goodness has appointed the offices of rulers and councils for the welfare of society and the just government of man. We beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of such important trust in this our island. Let thy blessing descend upon us here in assembly gathered and grant that we may, as in thy presence, treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberations in so just and faithful a manner as to promote the honor and glory and to advance the good of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. All which we seek in thy name and for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Please be seated, please. Motion for the approval of the order paper as circulated. Okay. Mr. President, President, I rise to move a motion for the approval of the order paper as circulated. Mr. President, I rise to second that motion. The question is, the, move, the motion for approval of the order paper is circulated. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Messages from the Deputy Governor General, announcements by the President. Go ahead. Papers to be laid, statements by ministers. Mr. President, I rise to Mr. President, I rise to make a brief statement as per the order paper. And I want to very briefly, Mr. President, give an update as it regards to the severance claim here on the island of Nevis. We all would recall, Mr. President, that the island of Nevis and the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, and certainly by extension the entire world, would have been affected by the dreaded COVID. 19 pandemic. And here in Sinkits and Nevis is no exception. We have seen, Mr. President, where many persons would have lost their job. Many persons would have been underemployed. And many businesses here in the Federation would have seen a significant downturn in their various businesses. In 2020, Mr. President, we saw some 759 claims submitted for severance payment. That was to the extent in 2020 of the impact of COVID on the island of Nevis. In 2021, thus far, we have seen some 69 claims for severance payment. Mr. President, out of the 759 claims of 2020, we have seen some 
and $67,772.72 paid. We still have some 184 claims of 2020 still outstanding. Mr. President, in 2021 thus far, we have seen some 6 million $530,268.24 paid in severance payment. That gives a combination of 2020 and 2021 of some $11,598,040.96 up until July 12, 2021. Mr. President, to date of the global figure, some 740 claims have been approved. 83 is pending and five have been disqualified. All of the claimants who have been paid in installments of $20,000 have all been paid in full. 18 of the 69 applicants submitted in 2021 have already been approved, and most of the 184 pending applicants for 2020 was processed in 2021. Mr. President, there has undoubtedly been a shock to the system, to the severance system, and these numbers is an indication as to what has transpired thus far as it regards to the severance claim here on the island of Nevis. I want to say to those persons who are still waiting their payment, to bear with us, it has been a tedious process, it has been a meticulous process, and it certainly has been a time-consuming process, Mr. President. And I believe that while the process is still ongoing, I want to use this opportunity to say to those persons who would have received their severance payment to use it wisely and to spend it carefully because I believe that all of us would still agree that there is still some uncertainty when it comes to COVID-19. Mr. President, I want to switch very quickly to a project that the cabinet would have passed on to me as it regards to an issue that we face at the Cherry Garden Housing Development. Mr. President, we have seen over the years that a number of persons in that housing development would have had some issues with their septic and soakery systems. And the cabinet would have taken a decision to ensure that we bring a lasting solution to this issue. In our canvassing in 2013 and in 2015, we heard the cries of the persons in that housing development. And this is a government, Mr. President, that often hears the cry of our people, and we often respond. And we responded, and we responded, Mr. President, with ensuring that some 30 persons would have had their soak away system in Cherry Garden remedied. It was budgeted for some $280,000. And at the end of the project, we saw the final figure of some $274,470.85. I believe, Mr. President, that this $277,000 $470.85 were money well spent in ensuring, in ensuring, Mr. President, that 
the persons of Cherry Garden were in a much more healthier environment. If but for nothing else, if but for nothing else, I believe that this project would have significantly improved the health condition of the Cherry Garden Housing Project. I want to take this opportunity to thank the on-site supervisor, Mr. Alisa Thompson, for having oversight of this project. On the budget. On the budget. And I want to thank him, Mr. President, because those of us who know Mr. Thompson very well, he is a no-nonsense kind of individual, highly motivated and highly proactive. And we felt that he would have been the best person to have oversight of this project. And I believe that he would have delivered to the people of Cherry Garden and to the people of Nevis a project that is commendable, that I believe would improve their health condition. I want to say from this rostrum to Mr. Thompson and all of the other workers who would have supported him, the heavy equipment operators, the plumbers, how thankful we are for their yeoman service in rendering a successful completion of this project. Mr. President, I would move very quickly to a number of road projects that is presently ongoing on the island. This government would have given a commitment to the people of Butlers and to the people of Bath that in 2021 we would see underground construction of the rehabilitation of their various road networks. And I'm happy to report, Mr. President, that on the 26th of May, 2021, our Public Works Department would have commenced the Butler's Road Rehabilitation and Restoration Project. To date, we have seen the pegging out of the main carriageway. We have seen the alignment. We have seen, Mr. President, some excavation and some retaining wall that is presently ongoing. And I believe that the progress thus far, Mr. President, is worthy of the Public Works Department because we know of their capability. I want to appeal, however, to the good people of Butlers to be patient and to bear with us. There will definitely be major disruption. At times, their electricity would be off at times, their water will be disconnected for remedial work. And I want to appeal to the good people of Butlers to work with the Public Works Department as we seek to execute this project. To Bath Village, we have committed to you as well. And we are hoping that before 2020, as far nigh from us, we will see the construction work Mr. President, let me, let, me, let me be a little more specific. Let me be a little more specific for the representative of Bath. <laughs> we have scheduled the commencement of the Bath Rehabilitation Project in the month of August. In the month of August, we hope to actually get on the ground in Bath to see the execution of that project in Bath. Mr. President... that we incorporated in our budget specifically some financing for drainage on the island of Nevis. And we have seen a number of communities around the Nevis have been affected by some drainage issues. In Clegot, in Ramsbury, in Pinnies. In other parts of Nevis, Mr. President, we have seen Properties are being affected by flooding due to some drainage issues. 
And we have comments in the Quadrocode area on the St. Thomas' side to have some drainage work done there to bring some relief to the neighborhood of Quadrocode. All the way down, Mr. President, to our dear, loving pastor, Pastor Griffin. We are hoping that we will get to that area very shortly while we continue this drainage project. In the Ramsbury area as well, we are, under, we are seeing some drainage work there in the area of Shiloh Baptist and where that famous steel pan player Janice Nisbet resides in that area there. And we intend, Mr. President, to see additional drainage work throughout the length and breadth of Nevis to bring some relief to our people. Because I feel that if God forbids we have these torrential rain and we lose any of our residents because of improper drainage, the first thing persons would say, why didn't the government do something about it? Well, we are doing something about it, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move on very quickly to the water enhancement and development here on the island of Nevis. We would recall, Mr. President, that we undertook some water enhancement development in the Hamilton area at the water site in Hamilton. We would have installed a water storage tank. We would have installed a water filtration system. We would have connected a well that has been dormant for many years into the system and have it been treated. Now, Mr. President, we are securing that site. We believe that our water resource must be secured. We have completed securing the site there in Jessops, to the top of Jessops, at the intersection of Jessops and, and Barnsgott. And we are now ensuring that we complete the water facility there in the Hamilton area. We have gone a bit further, Mr. President, and we are ensuring that we replace the roof of the 100-year-old stone tank there with a steel frame roof that will give us some additional water storage capacity at the Hamilton site. Mr. President, those persons on the north side of the island of Nevis over the past week would have seen some difficulties with water. And we are ensuring that we are able to be in a position to shift some of the water from the Hamilton site to as far as four seasons to bring some relief to those persons in your castle and camps and that side of the island. So the redundancies, Mr. President, that we have built into our system continue to bear dividend while we shift water around the island. Mr. President, I would pause there because while I have a lot more to say, I believe that the information that I would have given in this house to the people of Nevis is information that I feel ought to be dispersed to our citizens. And I hope, Mr. President, that while we continue in our drainage mitigative measures, in our water enhancement, in our road improvement projects, and while we continue to manage the severance uh, claims on the island of Nevis, that the people of Nevis would continue to recognize that we are still under a COVID pandemic situation. And I wish that they would, in all cases, be mindful and be governed themselves accordingly. Mr. President, may it please you.
Mr. President, I rise with your permission to make a brief statement during this honorable sitting. And I'll focus mainly on two areas from my ministry, briefly on social services and then in the area of culture. Mr. President, I, I think we all know that we have been going through some very turbulent times over the past year. And I believe that there is light at the end of the tunnel. But during these very challenging, challenging and difficult times, Mr. President, this administration, this concerned citizens movement led Nevis Island administration has stood fast with the people on the island of Nevis. And we have been extremely supportive of our people. And I want to speak specifically about what my ministry has been doing with regards to the outreach from social services. I would have been here in this honorable house last year. I would have spoken to the people regarding what the Department of Social Services has been doing during the pandemic. Of course, we're not out of the woods as yet. And so I want to assure members of the general public that my ministry and my Department of Social Services continue to be very supportive, very vigilant, very responsive to the needs of our people. Of course, we know that a lot of our people have been suffering. We know a lot of persons have been displaced. A lot of persons have lost their incomes. A lot of persons have lost their jobs. The pandemic has torn apart relationships and families, unfortunately. But guess what? Social services is always there to lend assistance and to lend a helping hand. And I'm very proud of what we have done over the past year and what we'll continue to do to ensure that the people of Nevis are well looked after. And so, within the Department of Social Services, during all of this unprecedented time that we have gone through, during all of the lockdowns last year, and of course we had one last week as well, social services has never been locked down. Never been locked down. We have been up and about every day, every week, every month. And uh, irrespective of what the situation has been on the ground, we have continued to provide our meals program to our less fortunate, our vulnerable in the community. And so whether there's a lockdown or not, the staff at the kitchen there in Gingerland has been working overtime to ensure that our seniors and our vulnerable, those who are entitled to the meals program, are fed, and fed well. Of course, I would have reported last year as well, and what would have happened again last week, that during the lockdown, our Department of Social Services would have ensured that caregivers and family members of persons who need care who need attention, they get the required care and they get the required attention. And so we would have been facilitating this process, dialogue with the security forces, and ensuring that persons who need to be checked on, who need to be fed, who need to be clothed, who need to be looked after, their caregivers and their families, family members were there even during the periods of lockdown. Mr. President, of course, one of the main things that we normally do, that we normally facilitate in the Department of Social Services is our food vouchers. And uh, over the past year, we have been inundated with requests. And we have tried as much as possible, Mr. President, to accede to these requests for persons to get assistance. Of course, as I said, persons have been affected mainly with the income. And social services, that social safety net remains in place to assist persons who have been mostly in need of assistance and very proud once again of the assistance we have, we have been given regarding the food vouchers. 
I have to say here, Mr. President, because the notion exists out there sometimes that when persons come to social services, they show up today and they expect to get sometimes the assistance in the next five minutes or in the next hour. Sometimes that is not possible. There is a process that has to be done to be followed. And when persons come to social services, there has to be an interview process. Because of course we know we are all human. And sometimes people try to cheat the system. We don't want that to happen. Apart from cheating the system, you have sometimes people who want to double dip and triple dip. They are already getting assistance somewhere here and they also want a food voucher. We are trying as much as possible at social services to spread the love, to spread what we have. And so we reach as many persons as possible and we reach those who need the assistance most. And so, sometimes we get a complaint. People say that we are a bit slow in responding. That is not the case. But it has to be, there has to be a process and the process has to be followed. We have to ensure that when you come to social services that we investigate and that you are who you say you are. Of course, Mr. President, I would have spoken about this last year as well, but I'm just gonna mention it again briefly to say that during this unprecedented period that our counselors have been providing human service, I know it is not easy. It hasn't been easy during this period, Mr. President. And persons have been under some deep psychological stress. And so the Department of Social Services, through our counseling unit, we have been there to provide that assistance for persons who need that assistance. Of course, we have heard of instances sometimes where persons are home, they are frustrated, they want to take out their frustration on their partner or on their spouse, and that is something that we discourage. But if it happens, the staff at social services, the capable and competent staff, is there to assist where that is concerned. And so, Mr. President, I want once again to encourage persons when they come to social services to be very, be very courteous, to have patience. We will assist you, but we are asking you to cooperate with us and the assistance will eventually come. And once again, I want to commend the director and her team at social services for the really fantastic job that they have done over the past year as we navigate through these very difficult times in this pandemic. Mr. President, I'm gonna switch very quickly to Culturama. <laughs> I heard people laugh when I say Culturama. I would have been here last year, Mr. President. I would have been on the radio, I would have been on the television. And when I spoke last year, the expectation was that we're gonna be having a full-fledged Culturama this year. But of course, when we're dealing with an enemy like COVID-19. You never know what the situation will hold. You never know what the future will hold. And we have seen the effects of COVID-19 over the past year. When it, when it came last year, we thought this thing was gonna blow off in a couple of months. And I'm sure all of us thought that we would have been back to normal in the year 2021. You know, when I listened to the Premier and the member for Nevis too, a couple of, I think a couple of days ago, he said he has lost two years as the premier because we have practically lost two years from the pandemic. And unfortunately, we have almost lost two culture armors from the pandemic. And so we were planning to have our culture armor this year, end of July, early August, Mr. President. But here comes the big bad old COVID-19. And with the lockdown that we would have had um, last week, um, it halted practically everything. We had already gotten permission from the COVID-19 task force to proceed with our events. Some of them would have been virtual, of course. But because of the lockdown and the um, non-rehearsal some, for some of the activities, we had to cancel what we, are, we were planning. We had to cancel the Mr. Cool, 
and the swimwear competition that was scheduled for this year. We had scaled back our activities, but I think I can say, and I believe that persons will be happy to hear, that even though we had to cancel what we were planning for late July, early August, that you will be having some semblance of culture armor over the Independence Holiday Weekend. Mr. President, you look like you're ready to jam. You look up quick when I say that, boy. We will be having some semblance of activities because the good thing about it is that we had already received permission from the COVID-19 task force, and so the permission is there. All we need to do now is say, well, we are rescheduling. And so I know that the Calypsonians and the Soka artists in particular, and I believe I see two of the Calypsonians in here, they will be very happy to hear because they would have put in a lot of work, Mr. President. The Calypsonians and the Soka artists in particular, they would have put a lot of work in, they would have put a lot of money in, and they would have released some of their songs, they would have been rehearsing already, and we don't want to left, leave them in the cold. And so we have proposed some activities for the Independence Weekend to ensure that our artists have an outlet and persons, some of the persons, persons in general on the island can have some enjoyment for the culturama. And so I'm going to very quickly just go through what we have planned, the proposed dates for our events for the independence and the pre-activities. We are hoping to have Calypso tents on August the 14th and the 28th. We are proposing to have the Soka Monarch semifinals on Saturday, September the 4th. The Senior Calypso semifinals on Sunday, September the 5th. On Sunday, September the 12th, we are planning to have a fashion show that will showcase our fashion designers on the island of Nevis. And we do have quite a lot of very talented fashion designers on the island of Nevis. And when we go quickly to our official activities on Thursday, September 16th at National Heroes Day, we are planning what we call a culture pot. That is a production staged by the Nevis Cultural Development Foundation to showcase the best of division culture. And the event would feature a blend of traditional folklore, folk music, contemporary dance, along with Calypso and Soka performances. On Friday, the 17th of September, Poets in the Square, lunchtime performances at the War Memorial Square in Charlestown by some of the Federation's best poets. And on the evening of Friday, September 17th, the Night of Steel, a steel band competition between some of the Federation's leading steel orchestras. Saturday, the 18th of September, Nivision Heritage Day, an initiative of the Ministry of Tourism highlighting Nivision cuisine, folklore, and folk music at the Heritage Village in Fothergills. And then on the evening, we have the Soka Monarch Contest. And this contest, of course, will target eight finalists competing in the groovy and groovy category, and eight finalists competing in the power category. Then on Sunday, September 19th, Independence Day, the Senior Calypso Finals, where we will see eight finalists singing in two rounds of Calypso, and that they will be backed by an all-star band, um, carefully selected from across St. Kitts and Nevis. Then on Monday, September 20th, Independence Day, and I want vaccinated persons to listen carefully to this one, because we have been encouraging people to get vaccinated all along, and sometimes there are advantages to being vaccinated, Mr. President. I believe you have been fully vaccinated so I believe you will take advantage of this activity. What we are proposing, what we are proposing on Monday, the 20th of September, which will be a public holiday, T-shirt mass, and that we are proposing that activity for fully vaccinated revelers only. And it will be hosted at the Villa Grounds, and the event will run from 1 to 7 p.m. And what we are proposing to do is to sell some t-shirt packages ahead of the event to fully vaccinated persons only. So only if you're fully vaccinated will you be able to attend that function at the Villa Grounds. And then in the evening there will be the dramatic presentation that will be staged by the Nevis Theatre and Film Association. Mr. President, I want to 
quickly to thank our sponsors who have been on board from the onset, National Bank, Flow, TDC, and we are hoping to get others on board. I'm sure some of them will get excited when they hear about the activities that we have planned for the Independence Weekend, and we are asking you to come on board, and we are asking members of the public for your support. You'll be hearing much more. I'll be making an official statement on this um, reschedule of events, and so you can look forward in the coming weeks to hear much more. Mr. President, as I'm about to wrap up, if you will permit me as well, quickly, to just at this point in time, as the Minister of Sports in the Nevis Island Administration, to congratulate Amaya Clark, who took the silver medal at the 100 meter dash at the North American, Central American, and Caribbean Athletic Association, NACAC under 23 games held in Costa Rica from the 9th to the 11th of July. I must say here as well that I, we must congratulate our very own Leroy Chapman from the island of Nevis, who would have been part of the Federation's four member team that journeyed to Costa Rica to take part. Now, Leroy did not medal, but he performed creditably. And we want to congratulate him, very humble and committed athlete. And I believe Leroy still have places to go. And of course, we were also represented by Janassa Francis and Ian Leibard. I want to commend and congratulate the entire contingent. And while I'm doing so, I want to congratulate our Olympians who will be heading to Tokyo, Amaya Clark and Jason Rogers, and wish them all the very best from the Ministry of Sports in Nevis. And finally, Mr. President, I want just before I sit down, to congratulate as well the Department of Youth under my watch for their fantastic initiative. They have put out a song and a music video called Save the Earth. They think it is an excellent piece and it is calling on all of us in Nevis, in the Federation and around the world to treat Mother Earth more kindly. So I want to commend you the director and staff at the Department of Youth, and I would encourage persons who have not looked at the video yet to log on to their Facebook page and look at and like the video. Mr. President, may it please you. Mr. President, I rise to make a contribution to this Honorable House at this time on the item G of the order paper that was circulated, that is a statement by ministers. And as I rose to come to the microphone, my colleague and member for Nevis 3 would have reminded me that this is not a budget presentation, so be as brief. <laughs> so I'm going to be cognizant of that as I may make my presentation this morning, Mr. President. But be that as it may, it is my pleasure to stand here this morning and speak about three different areas that I am responsible for. One being disaster management, the other being agriculture, and also housing as well. So I would want to start this morning, Mr. President, by reminding the general public that we are still in the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season, which started on the 1st of June and will end on the 30th of November. And the hurricane season, of course, is in high gear at this time, and it is important for us to always uh, be prepared and stay prepared. The Caribbean is now warmer than normal, while tropical Atlantic sea surface temperatures are near average, and the subtropical Atlantic remains warmer than normal as well. Five named storms have already occurred before the end of July, and that is phenomenal. The Colorado State University on July 9th, Mr. President, updated their forecast with an increased number of named storms from 17 to 20, and the number of hurricanes from eight to nine. The warming of sea surface temperatures in combination with uh, that natural phase called El Nino are contributing factors for the above normal Atlantic hurricane season that we may be experiencing this year. 
Mr. President, the disaster management, uh, the, the Nevis Disaster Management Committee has continued its preparatory work and actions in anticipation of this hurricane season. The M NDMC convened its first meeting on the 20th of April, 2021. Of course, that would have been under the chairmanship of the minister responsible, which is myself. I will also say as well, Mr. President, the NDMD staff has participated in several regional meetings to date and also some training via webinars. The Nisivis Disaster Management Plan and Emergency Contact List have also been updated and have been circulated to the general public. I am pleased to also report, Mr. President, that all subcommittees have reported a state of readiness. Emergency shelters as well have been inspected and a list have been circulated to the general public via lo the local media and also on social media as well. Some good things have been happening also at the Cotton Ground and the Pond Hill Community Centers, which were outfitted with uh, 1,000 gallon water tanks and also aluminum hurricane shutters. We are also in the process and have done so in regards to the Cotton Ground Community Center in installing VHF radio equipment. VHS, VHF sorry, radio equipment are scheduled to be installed at the Butler's Community Center, which is also an emergency center as well, along with the Alberta Payne Emergency Center in Bath. And this was all made available, or these equipment were all made available to us by the Japan, Japanese Embassy grass, Grassroots Funding Program. So those will want to acknowledge the Japanese Embassy and their continued support to disaster management here on the island of Nevis. Of course, the Japanese government have assisted us in many other areas, including fisheries and also training in other areas that we are eternally thankful for. I would also want to report at this time, Mr. President, that emergency relief stocks have been enhanced, complements the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Southern Military Command, who continue to work with us and partner with us in ensuring that we are kept ready and are always ready for any unforeseen circumstances. Shelter management as, as well, Mr. President, have seen some training being done, and at least one individual from the Public Works Department recently completed training in initial damage assessment. Last year and the year before, and even up to 2017, now back in 2017, uh, we would have had some difficulties in assessing some of the damages that was done here on the island of Nevis, and we have committed to ensuring that moving forward, any incident that occurred that we have uh, the most accurate assessment being done so that we can benefit from any grants or relief programs that are available to us. Resources here on the island are always scarce, Mr. President, and any assistance in time of need will always be welcome. We also have training being done for our community emergency response team of volunteers, and those will be scheduled uh, throughout the month of August as well, as we continue our pre preparation, Mr. President. I want to say, Mr. President, the Hurricane Awareness and Preparedness Public Campaign continues on uh, media outlets such as Von Radio, NTV, social media, and the likes. And on February 9th, the department would have partnered with the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, CDEMA, and the West Indies Cricket Team Disaster Fighters. That is something new that I am uh, being made aware of in promoting hurricane awareness and preparedness. And the featured cricket icon was or is the 
local cricket star, Mr. Kyron Powell, who was the featured person uh, during that particular event. I want to commend him for being the face of disaster management as well. So Mr. President, I want to reiterate our stance from the Nevis Disaster Management um, Department that you can never be too prepared. But I would also go on further to say that uh, when you are not prepared, you're actually preparing to fail. And that is why we are asking persons to uh, examine their, their house, do the necessary basic things that are, are needed to enhance the security of your property, uh, put all of the necessary documents and so forth that are important to you in a place where they can be retrieved at short notice. Those who live in low-lying areas develop an escape plan or if needs be and you're called upon to evacuate, please evacuate. Do not put all uh, disaster personnel in harm's way by refusing to do so. We know not what the rest of the season would hold for us. All of us will pray that we are spared this year. And we have been, if I can use the word lucky thus far, but I will say it's God's blessings that we have been spared of any major disaster over the last uh, five years at least. But we have had our challenges and we know what storms can do in recent times. We are seeing storms moving from tropical storms to category one, to category two, to category five in hours. Short, short period of time, Mr. President. So we do not want to be caught unprepared. We do not want to be caught in a state where we are, uh, well, in a state of chaos, I would say, if we are not preparing properly for the rest of this upcoming season. Not only that, we have the pandemic to deal with, so we have more than enough on our plates, but it is what nature has thrown to us and it, it is what mankind has thrown to us. So we just have to continue to cope with these circumstances. So be prepared. That is the ultimate message. And stay prepared until the end of this hurricane season. Mr. President, agriculture. At the start of the pandemic season, or period, I should say, we would have made a simple but profound statement. And that was the pandemic would have provided us with some unexpected opportunities. And of course, in those opportunities, we would have received some unexpected realities as well. Opportunities, I would say, for us to produce more, to look within and not outwards. We have always said that any time you have a disaster, we would be most affected, even though it does not affect us directly, we will be the most, uh, most uh, we will be affected by the fact that most countries that are major producers throughout the world will be more concerned with producing uh, enough to feed themselves and not so much to export to these parts. And we have seen examples of that. Even if we were to get some of these products that reach our shores, prices would change, meaning demand will affect the price. Our supply will also affect the price as well. And we have seen that in recent times that some prices have changed on some of the products that we consume here. Fruits and vegetables for sure. And that is why we would have said from the onset of this pandemic, let us go back to our backyards. Let us who are a major farmers on the island produce more so that we can feed our people in times of need. I have said to the folks at the Department of Agriculture, even if we cannot sell for optimum prices, we can sell at the most reasonable, reasonable of prices so that everyone on the island can have something to eat. It also means that as the government and we are producing, we can always make contributions to some of the uh, agents or, or departments of government, that is, such as the flamboyant home, the hospital, or security forces who are working tirelessly. We can make contributions to them because, of course, it is the government's contribution to the overall uh, process of ensuring that we are feeding ourselves. So as such, we have seen some up, uptake or uptick in the production of uh, fruits and vegetables here on the island of Nevis. 
And indeed, the Department of Agriculture continues to ensure that food and nutrition security and the improvement of our livelihoods uh, during this particular pandemic period is sustained. I want to look, Mr. President, at some of the efforts that we've had over the last quarter, which is the second quarter. I will also emphasize that certain factors continue to negatively affect the sector, such as climate change, which include drought and, and uh, excessive heat as well. We have had some mechanical challenges with our equipment and implements as well at the department. The availability of seeds, financing have been a problem for some of our farmers, and of course I mentioned the, the COVID-19 as a factor as well, whereby we have seen a reduction in the markets that are available to us uh, since some of the hotels are operating, yes, but at a much uh, smaller scale or reduced numbers in terms of employees and also persons who are staying at these hotels. There are some restaurants as well, Mr. President, that are either not operating at this time but on limited hours. So some of these things would have negatively impacted the overall sale of some of the products, but we still continue to uh, produce nonetheless. Even though these uh, factors pose some challenges, I still want to report that we've had some significant production of vegetable crops here on the island of Nevis. As a matter of fact, our staff at the department continues to provide technical support and assistance to our farmers in areas of pest and disease management and crop forecasting. That is important so we do not have an oversupply and an abundance of uh, products on the market that are not consumed. We don't want any wasted, so we have been trying to educate our farmers in this regard. I will say though, over the last period of reporting, which is the second quarter, we had an accumulative acreage of planting. This is by the department and also our farmers of 32.5 acres, yielding approximately 379,242 uh, 0.42 pounds of vegetables and crop products. That is significant, Mr. President. I, someone asked for me to repeat it. Someone asked for me to repeat it? <laughs> I think it'd be so good you say it twice. Okay. okay, so as I was saying, Mr. President, over the second quarter, we had an accumulative acreage, sorry, of um, food that was planted on 32.35 acres of land. That is both our farmers and the Department of Agriculture with a yield of approximately 379,242.2 pounds of vegetables. That is significant, Mr. President. I'm gonna break it down some more so that at least we have a better appreciation of what was planted and how these yields were accomplished. I will say at this point, Mr. President, that the department has targeted 10 major crops, which we consider crops that can be used uh, as, as we say, um, import substitutes, things that we can produce here that we, at some point in the future, will have no need to import. These would include cabbage, carrots, corn, cantaloupe, onion, sweet pepper, pumpkin, sweet potato, tomato, watermelon, and so on. Now these are some of the products that we have had a tremendous success with and we continue to produce these at an optimum level. Very shortly we expect to add some additional crops as well such as yam, banana, tanya, okra, cucumber, etc. But these are the types of crops that, of course, all of these can be put on one plate or can form your, uh, your, your menu, for example, for an entire week. So at least we can be producing these things right here on the island and feeding ourselves here. But in terms of, as I said, let me break down that 32.35 acres of, of land that I was speaking of, Mr. President. Our farmers would have, in the second quarter, uh, 
cultivated 23.56 acres of land. And out of that, or out of those particular uh, cultivation that they would have done, they would have produced and yielded 256,100.12 pounds of vegetables. That's 256,100.12 pounds of vegetables. That is significant yield. If I were to just go back to the first quarter, just for comparison, 15 acres, 15.1 acres of land was uh, cultivated by our farmers, yielding 138,520 pounds of vegetables. I will say that's uh, an increase of just about what? The percentage I don't have here, but we can always do the, 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 the percentage of increase there as well. But that's significant. Well over 100,000 pounds, if I can do some quick maths, Mr. President. The government, on the other hand, in uh, the first quarter would have done 5.4 acres of land, yielding 83,607.70 pounds of vegetables. However, in the second quarter, the government estates would have, uh, or would have well, the government would have cultivated on their estates 8.79 acres of land, yielding 123,000 142.30 pounds of vegetables. So then if we were to do both comparisons total, in the first quarter, 222,127.70 pounds of vegetables were uh, cultivated by both farmers and the government estates. In the second quarter, 32.35 acres yielded 379,000 242.42 pounds of vegetables. That is significant, Mr. President, and it can only get better. Because as I said before, the whole idea coming out of the pand pandemic, as we seek to recover from some of the challenges we've um, encountered over the past year, is to grow more. By growing more, we are expected to fulfill some of the demands here on the island of Nevis and eliminate some of the imports that enter our shores. So it is all about ensuring that we are providing this island with an upward trajectory in, in agriculture. And I think we are doing a phenomenal job to date. And we'll do more as we go along. And I'll tell you about more as I go along quickly, Mr. President. The abattoir, for example, we've had some phenomenal results there, Mr. President. For the second quarter, the Abattoir will, would have seen an increase of 20.45% increase over the same quarter of production in areas such as ground beef, smoked hams, smoked chicken, meatballs, and also pork bacon. All of these things are produced here, Mr. President. You go to the supermarkets and see some fancy packaging uh, filled with all kinds of salts and additives, but we're getting you pure and wholesome products right here on the island of Nevis. You hear about these things? Ground beef has had an increase in demand here on the island of Nevis. I am certain that the folks at uh, the abattoir will be pleased with their effort. Not only here, but we have penetrated the market in St. Kitts as well too. You go into Value Mart, for example, and St. Kitts, you'll see all locally uh, produced ground beef. You go to any one of the supermarkets here, you'll see that as well. And that is an excellent effort being made on the part of the folks at the, the abattoir. And I want to commend them. I want to also commend all of the livestock farmers who would have bought into uh, the, uh, the efforts that we're making there and understand what it means to produce local. Now, here is what is significant as well, Mr. President. Our livestock farmers who would have supplied our abattoir with, meat, with uh, various meat products, whether it's pork, mutton, chicken, beef, would have gone home with an accumulated figure of $94,636.23. That is what our farmers would have, would have received in payment for the meat they would have provided to our abattoir. That is $94,636.23. That is a significant increase, for example, 
over the first quarter, and this is the second quarter reporting. That was a 94% increase, 94.38% increase over the previous, previous quarter. And May and June were significant month in contributing to this amount. For example, April, we would have paid out $14,076.58 to all livestock farmers in May. A significant jump to $47,169.70. Let me get it right. It's a lot of thousands, so uh, there are a lot of farmers out there who are a couple thousand dollars richer. Let me repeat May for you, Mr. President. Perhaps you might have sold a, a, a cattle or something as well and gotten some of those thousands. But in May, we would have seen a significant increase of $47,169.70. And then in June, $33,389.95, making it $94,636.23 paid out to our livestock farmers. We did buy some beef from the island of St. Kitts, and we have had some significant increase in purchases there. And it is a good thing. Some may see it as a negative, I see it as a positive. It has never happened before because we have had some struggles here on the island in meeting the demand uh, for beef. But we have to understand as well a lot of small business operators have certainly come into the market in recent times and have been selling their burger, burgers. So you'll need your beef burger patties. Some have been selling a lot of uh, patties as well that require um, ground beef along with uh, pizzas and the like. So there are a lot of demand and increased demand for beef products. So we have certainly had some support from our farmers in syndicates and I want to thank them. We got from syndicates just about 6,021 pounds of beef from syndicates amounting to 39,000 $136.50. So we are partnered in this thing, Mr. President. We are partnering with livestock farmers and syndicates, and by the same token, farmers in syndicates are partnering for, with farmers in Nevis. We have bridged that divide, and we are making sure that we are uh, uh, providing that level of uh, sustainability in agriculture in the Federation. Mr. President, quickly moving along, Indian Castle, let me focus quickly on that and give the general public a quick update. Mr. President, at Indian Castle, we have just about 35 acres of land that have been fenced for some time, was on the production to some extent. We have planted cassava there, sweet potatoes. As a matter of fact, when we came into government back in 2013, we met an abandoned crop of uh, cotton there. And I say abandoned because for some reason we would have gone back to those dark old days of cotton production. Didn't get anywhere and it was not my intention as the Minister of Agriculture and at that time the technical persons at the department never saw any interest in, in uh, cotton production. So we would have been planning and trying to put something in place down at Indian Castle so that we can have some production. 35 acres of land is a a significant acreage of land, and we would have certainly put it on the production, and I'm going to report to you some of the things that are happening there. We have invested just over $150,000 down there at Indian Castle, and I've already planted just about 3,000 uh, fruit trees, Mr. President. We have planted 400 guava trees, about 300 roots of, uh, not roots, sorry, 300 sugar apple trees, 1,310 coconut trees. We have also planted just about 7.4 acres of passion fruits and dragon fruit trees. 135 gooseberry trees. 55 cigarette trees, that is to provide some buffer as well. 165 pungonet trees. 1.75 acres of banana trees. 230 avocado um, trees. 190 sour sap, half acre of sorrel, about one tenth of an acre of arrow root, 60 mango trees, and these are the Amri Pali mango trees on one acre of land, about 130 citrus trees of varied types, and about one acre of cassava. Now, this is just to date, Mr. President, we continue to plant. 
and we'll plant more as we go along. As a matter of fact, I have hinted to the members of cabinet, my colleagues, that at some point I want to take them down there to have a look at what we are doing there. This is the first time I believe we have gone into such level of production in one area. The land was there underutilized. It was utilized, yes. Uh, but my in your constituency, yeah. don't start a break. Don't start a break yet, but that's okay. <laughs> we go all around the island and do many things. And I, I'm pleased that you're, I'm happy that you're pleased that we're in your area and doing okay. significant things as well. Mr. President, when we are done with that area, it would be one of those showpieces that will continue to produce. The type of crops that we have chosen here will be producing for years to come. As a matter of fact, we started a project here at Cades Bear, which we consider to be a leisure farm whereby locals and tourists can enter that particular compound and tour the area and pick some fruits. Well, you'll have to pay to enter and you can pick some fruits and go home, have a smoothie or whatever the case might be at Kids Bay, but we want to duplicate that at Indian Castle. And you hear me say that we have planted 1,310 uh, coconut trees. Mr. President, just over a month ago or thereabout, we would have imported just about 5,350 coconuts of varied variety from Guyana. Some, some of those have been planted at Indian Castle as well. We have the, the green, the orange and yellow varieties, the Malaysian and the, and the, the yellow, the, the green is the Malaysian, and the yellow is, uh, well, I'll get that for another time. But anyway, those of you who are familiar with uh, those dwarf jelly trees, we have three different varieties here on the island, and we would have received those three different varieties out of Guyana. They have, some have been planted. We will make some available to the Nivision public at, as well, at a cost. So it won't be free, but we want to eliminate some of the import of those jellies that come here from all the way in countries such as St. Vincent and Dominica. Because they cannot be fresh when they get here, Mr. President. They take about a week to get here. We want to be able to pick a jelly this morning and consume it immediately. That's when you're drinking some fresh water, wholesome. And I see some people now are now uh, substituting uh, the, the natural water, plain water with jelly water in some regard. That is nice because, of course, you get the necessary electrolytes and ingredients from that jelly that sustain you and nourish you. So we want our people to be healthy, and we want everyone to plant a jelly tree in their yard and have something to drink every day, some jelly to drink every day. Nothing is wrong with that. That is an excellent thing to do. And we'll continue to push the planting and replanting of jelly trees throughout the island of Nevis. You hear the number that we would have gotten from Guyana. 5,350 nuts we would have gotten from Guyana. That is significant, and we are hoping to get more in the near future. Mr. President, moving quickly along. Recently, through an initiative of the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, we would have distributed five new greenhouses to five farmers here on Nevis. Now we would have chosen five farmers who are currently in greenhouse production. There's a reason why we did that. We wanted to make sure that at least if you have one greenhouse, you're able to increase your production with a second greenhouse. Because you're familiar with the technology, you're aware of the challenges of the technology, and you know how to mitigate those challenges. But we believe strongly in protected agriculture, and that is why we are investing in greenhouse technology once again. Some years ago, uh, the SIDF would have invested significantly in greenhouse technology on the island of St. Kitts, whereby somewhere around 35 greenhouses were distributed to farmers on St. Kitts. None came to Nevis. Let me repeat that again, none came to Nevis. If the minister and member for Nevis three can recall, in 2013, I would have asked him to put a proposal together to submit to the SIDF for two shade or two greenhouses. Up to this day, we, did not, we haven't gotten a response. But that's okay. It was always my intention and the intention of this government to focus heavily on protected agriculture and greenhouse technology. We have seen some phenomenal results from some farmers such as Mackie Truss. We have seen some significant results from farmers such as Richard Paris, Daniel Atterton, 
and also uh, young farmers such as Anthony Geja and Najee, or Najee Hanley? That's his name, yes. That's the son of Panko. We have seen some results from them. So we wanted to give them that added support to produce more in areas such as or vegetables such as lettuce, cabbage, tomatoes, green and colored pepper, cucumber and kale, those type of things thrive in the greenhouse environment. And a 40 by 100 greenhouse, 40 feet by 100 feet, produces the same amount of, of products that you'll get in an acre of land in open field farming. But of course, you minimize the threat of the, the weather, pests and diseases, and all of those other challenges that can affect your, 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 your production. So we have invested in these farmers, and I want to say now that we will be getting more. I believe we may even get 10 or 20 more, so we'll identify other farmers or potential farmers who can utilize these greenhouses here in Nevis and also on the island of St. Kitts. Why we are doing that is because we mentioned the word before, import substitution. Some of these products are much more tasty. They, are, they have more integrity once they're produced locally. We know where they come from, Mr. President. You can walk right up to one of these farmers and walk into their shade house and see uh, the environment under which these products are being produced. That is why it makes it more healthy and more uh, important for us to emphasize local production and local farming. Now, in terms of cost, though, each one of these greenhouses would have been procured at the cost of 67,500 EC dollars. 67,500 EC dollars. So you multiply that by five. Here on the island of Nevis, we would have invested $350,000 thereabout in five farmers. I mentioned the names in terms of who would have been in the production before, and they're the ones we are concentrating on this time. Najee Hanley, uh, Mackie Truss, uh, Richard Paris, Daniel Atterton, and Anthony Gager. So we have invested $350,000 in these farmers, and we expect them to produce all of the things you just hear me mention, along with uh, certain herbs and scallions and thyme and that kind of thing. Those thrive well in greenhouse setting. And we want them to utilize those greenhouses and make the best of them so that we can be all the better here on the island of Nevis. Mr. President, I mentioned that we are on our recovery efforts here in agriculture. We are not blaming uh, the pandemic anymore. We are not concentrating on what we are, the challenges we have now in terms of climate change and the likes. We are looking at all of the necessary things we can do to bring ourselves to the point where we can produce and produce more. These challenges are not going to stop us at all. And so, Mr. President, uh, that is basically what I want to impart on agriculture. Oh, before I go quickly, we opened the Larinson Parry Agricultural Depot, marketing depot up there at Prospect, uh, back on the 10th of June. And I want to commend the family for supporting us in this regard. And I want to give our respects to the family and also uh, Mr. Parry. Well, I know him as, as Parry, just as Parry. As a young man in uh, in Brick Hill area, we used to see Parry in the morning driving those ladies and gentlemen to the various uh, estates, especially part work. And he used to do that throughout the island of Nevis on a given day and still had to go back in the afternoon and pick those same workers up and take them back to their homes. And I think he did so without any incidents that I can recall. So we used to call it Bounce of Parry because the roads were bad then and you used to see those ladies and gentlemen in the back of those Land Rovers bouncing all about but Parry was taking them to their jobs and, and, and back. And before we knew of... Uh, <laughs> sustainability in agriculture, innovation in agriculture, and all of the resilience we are talking about in agriculture, Mr. Parry knew all those then. That is Lawrence and Parry. He knew all that because his effort would have provided the foundation and the backbone to agriculture in this, this island, and we are the beneficiary of that, and we want to commend him for his effort. He's now dearly departed, but we want to commend him at this time and his family. And when I was given 
commendations to him. I thought he was up at four o'clock in the morning to get on the road to get the work done, but his wife, Jean, would have said he was up at two o'clock in the morning instead. Two, two a.m., getting ready to go and pick up the workers to take them to the various estates. I wish we had persons of that caliber now and persons with that type of, uh, <laughs> well, I, I wish we had persons who were willing to be the next Mr. Parry or Mr. Larison Parry right here on the island of Davis and in agriculture. I want to send a challenge out to all who are in agriculture at this time, extension officers, supervisors, field workers. Let us put out the effort on a daily basis uh, to, uh, to emulate someone like Mr. Parry. So that market in the vision I want all Nivision public to know where it is. It is right next to our agro-processing unit. We were in an area here at the back of the Charlestown market, uh, and I believe there were many deficiencies there that we have now overcome. We want that uh, market and division to play a pivotal role in making that connection to our hotels, our um, supermarkets, various shops, and, and all of the customers and persons who would utilize the service. We want that to be the area that persons will support and play the pivotal role that it can play in order to make sure that the goods that are produced here on the island of Davis make its way onto the plates of our people here on Nevis. Mr. President, quickly, uh, a little bit uh, on, on housing. I'm, I'm reminded of what I was told when I came up here. This is not a budget presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'll be done shortly. I'll, I'll, I'll be done shortly, Mr. President. But you know, when these microphones are turned on, sometimes you just talk. <laughs> but. Listen, the, the information is important to impart, so let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, housing. And before I get into housing, let me commend uh, the member for Nevis One uh, and minister responsible for public works, uh, uh, Honorable Spencer Brand. I want to commend him, the reason being, we are partners in this thing, Mr. President. I want to go back to 2016 when public works was engaged in the construction of many roads here on the island of Nevis, and the hands were full, so to speak. The Nevis Housing and Land Development Corporation would have come on board and assisted Public Works in undertaking some of the uh, projects that were being undertaken at that time. For example, the Joycelyn Library um, Kitchen, also the extension of the veterinary clinic, the Abattoir, uh, we have done the extension of the Charlestown, the finger pier as they call it, that's the tender pier, and many other projects we would have undertaken so as to eliminate some of the difficulties for uh, public works. This time around, because of the financial difficulties we've been experiencing at the NHLDC, we would have gone to public works for rescue, went to the cabinet, and they would have given the charge to Minister Brand and his team, and when I say his team, this includes the supervisor, Mr. Alistair Thompson. Here's what I'm going to say. Years ago, before we came into government, Mr. President, the administration before us would have uttered some words to public works. Go and practice, go and learn. Well, they have learned. And they have been executing some wonderful projects here on the island of Nevis. And this particular project of eliminating the difficulties being faced by some 30 homeowners over at, at Cherry Garden was indeed undertaken by public works and we have had glowing reports from those homeowners. That was meant to be done a long time, Mr. President. What happened over there, and this is, this is facts, there are septic and soak away that were not built properly. Because of the makeup of the soil, apparently when they started digging these soak aways and they got to a certain distance and they couldn't go any further, they said, let's pull it back up, cover it up and on our way. So somebody had to assume that problem and that difficulty at some point in the future. The future has come. And persons over there would have had some rather unsettling circumstances to deal with. And that is why as a good government, as a caring government, we would have undertaken the cost and the responsibility of rectifying those septic and soak away issues over there. So Mr. Brand, I want to publicly thank you and thank Alistair Thompson and his team, and all those who were involved in eliminating these particular difficulties to the tune. Oh. 
Well, the area representative could beat the chest easily anytime. You, know, you have a lot of chat. <laughs> but I want to, seriously, I want to commend. I want to commend first and foremost. Let me do that. Thanks for the reminder. The member for Nevis 1, Nevis 2, sorry. The member for Nevis 2 and area representative, the Honorable Mark Brantley, who would have canvassed the area. Well, he authorized the payment, but, 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 but more than that, Mr. President, he would have canvassed the area and the complaints would have come weeks after weeks, months after months. And of course, he would have made that commitment to the people of Cherry Garden. He made the commitment, and that is, you see, we don't make promises as a government, you know. We hear people talk about, I promise you this, and I promise you that. We always use the word commitment, because there's something much more palatable about that. It means that you have bound yourself to something that you will never swear away from. So I want to thank the member for Nevis too, and the representative for uh, uh, St. John's, for his commitment to his people, and for ensuring that this project came to fruition and came to reality and came to an end in a fitting way for the people of Cherry Garden. We always say that, you know, uh, folks before us would have turned poor people into paupers because to spend $10,000 on fixing a soaker way, that's leading you down the road of pauperism. Anyway, I'm going to leave that. This is not an area for, for controversy, Mr. President. Mr. President, quickly on housing, we are now about to roll out a couple of projects here on the island of Nevis. The Hamilton project that has been long in the making, not so much the, 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 the difficulty on our part, but actually we would have bought lands from, I believe it was three different landowners up there. So that process of consolidating all of those lands onto one title would have taken some time. And let me tell you the difficulty with constructing on different titles, you'll have a person with a house on one title, and the septic might be on another title. You understand the challenges there, Mr. President. That cannot happen in the housing development. So we had some difficulties having that done. It took some time, but that has been completed. So we're about to roll out. We'll have a groundbreaking ceremony shortly. We'll advise the general public about uh, the Hamilton housing development. We, are, we will be constructing 14 houses up there at... Uh, Hamilton, on 3.09 acres of land. We have had some approvals by the various financial institutions, so we are ready to go at Hamilton. So in short order, we'll see construction started there. At Craddock Road, which we'll be naming Mountain Crest Residences. Boy, these are some fancy names. Mountain Crest Residences. We will be constru constructing, sorry, 21 houses on 3. Six acres of land. At low ground, which is Cherry Garden, just above the housing development that exists there, Cherry Garden 1 and 2, this will be the third phase. This will be east of the existing housing development there. We'll be building or constructing 16 houses on 2.5 acres of land. At Rice's, we will be constructing nine houses on 1.89 acres of land. And then, of course, We'll continue with a phase three at Cedarview Housing Development uh, of 38 houses and 5.40 acres of land. What I will say to you, Mr. President, the lands at uh, low ground, those are government lands. The lands at, uh, at Madden's Cedarview, those are government lands. The other pieces of lands were bought by this government because we want to bring housing to our people in Hamilton, in Craddock Road, and in, uh, down at Rice's, we went and bought lands in those regards. We don't have any government land in those areas. So that is what will be accomplished over the next couple of months. We have some approvals that we are working on, and shortly we will start construct construction, assigning houses to contractors, uh, subcontractors, electrician, plumbers, uh, painters, and the like. And uh, as such, the Nevis Housing and Land Development Corporation will be fulfilling its mandate to its people, and that is uh, providing affordable housing to Nevisians. Mr. President, I want to wrap up by saying good things are about to happen since we have seen this reopening of the island of Nevis and the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis on Monday. 
We are hoping to see no more lockdown. We are hoping to see moving forward progress and more progress in the sense that construction would continue to boom. We just talk about some housing that we intend to do. Plus, in the private sector, we see uh, an up, upswing in construction. Persons are working. We have other areas that show shines of positive uh, results and positive activity. And we want that to continue. We want our people to continue to be vigilant and be cognizant of the fact that we are not out of the woods with COVID-19. So practice social, so, social distancing, uh, uh, adhere to the protocols, and do what is necessary to protect yourself and ultimately protect the island of Nevis to make sure that we can continue building this island and making it what we have always envisioned what it can be, and that is the Queen of the Caribbean. Mr. President, with those few words, I, I want to thank you. <laughs> And I reserve my right to speak on any future bill that comes before the parliament this morning. May please. and collaborate with the government to encourage citizens of Nevis to get vaccinated as quickly as possible as part of the government's vaccination drive. As a parliamentary, rep as a parliamentary representative for the Nevis Reformation Party, by letter dated May 19, 2021, after careful thought and consideration, I responded to the Honorable Premier's letter stating the opposition's position as it relates to the vaccine. We, the members of the opposition, do believe that the vaccination or the vaccine is a personal decision for our citizens and therefore we believe the best approach in dealing with the vaccine was for persons to consult their medical practitioners and then make their own personal decision based on the consultation. The Honorable Premier was informed that the opposition is committed to the cause of the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. I also took the opportunity in the said correspondence of May 19th to advocate for a comprehensive educational outreach programs that can reach all levels of the community. I also use the opportunity to propose for incentives to encourage and motivate the citizens and residents of Nevis to become vaccinated. Such incentives included, Mr. President, free medical consultation for side effects or other health issues that persons may experience after taking the vaccine. I also made a recommendation for the implementation of a vaccine help hotline where persons can get 
urgent medical advice as it relates to any side effects that they may experience as a result of the vaccine. Mr. President, I further made one final recommendation for the government to consider covering the cost of medical expenses for those who may suffer side effects after taking the vaccine. Mr. President, I am not aware to date that any of the recommendations or suggestions that were put forward by the parliamentary opposition were taken into consideration or actually enforced. I stand to be corrected if such measures were actually taken. Mr. President, after several exchanges of correspondence between the Honorable Premier, the parliamentary opposition extended an invitation to the Honorable Premier to meet to discuss these pertinent issues, not only as it relates to COVID-19, but also as it relates to the AstraZeneca vaccine. I am pleased to report, Mr. President, that on May 26, 2021, both the leader of the Nevis Reformation Party, Dr. Janice Daniel Hodge, and myself met with the Honorable Premier and we discussed a number of COVID-19 related issues. However, the vaccine was the major focus. At the conclusion of the said meeting, the opposition agreed to revert to the Honorable Premier with a decision as it relates to his previous invitation for collaboration to encourage persons to take the vaccine. Mr. President, while I applaud the Honorable Premier for the offer to involve the parliamentary opposition in the vaccination drive, I do regret that the offer was not extended perhaps earlier or sooner, and also the offer only focused on one aspect of the COVID-19 situation here in Nevis, and that was the vaccination. Mr. President, I do believe that perhaps greater and wider collaboration in terms of dealing with an holistic approach, a holistic approach, sorry, to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as greater collaboration as it relates to any economic recovery would have perhaps best served the interests of all citizens and residents of Nevis. Mr. President, I do believe that the opportunity still exists for a holistic collaboration in dealing with the living with COVID as well as the economic fallout from COVID. And so I take this opportunity to extend the invitation through this honorable house to members opposite to offer a wider, to offer a wider collaboration between both the opposition and the government so that we can get on the path of assisting our citizens in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID is perhaps will be here for longer than we initially anticipated. As such, we have to find a way to coexist and to learn to live with the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. President. Mr. President, we can all agree that the past few weeks, since we have seen the emergence of community spread of the COVID-19 virus in the shores of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, that it has been very stressful 
and taxing not only for the government, the opposition, but for all corners and walk of our society. Therefore, Mr. President, due to this anxiety and fear, a number of constituents, and by extension, the wider community of Nevis, have been posing some questions to the opposition. I wish to you, Mr. President, to perhaps make this Honorable House aware of some of the concerns that persons have raised, perhaps more specifically against the backdrop, Mr. President, of the address that the Honorable Prime Minister made last week, Thursday, in his address to the Federation. As it relates to the economic stimulus package, Persons have been asking, is that incentive of the economic stimulus package also applicable to Nevisions? For example, if I am permitted to be more specific, Mr. President, Mr. President, if I am permitted to be more specific, a dear constituent, last week asked, and I pose a question to the Honorable Premier, if bus drivers will, on Nevis will get the same stimulus package that those that the Prime Minister have announced for those on St. Kitts. I wish to state for record purposes, Mr. President, that that bus driver does not drive a blue bus. You see, Mr. President, these are concerns that have stemmed from our dialogue with the Honorable Premier and by extension, the NIA. The fact of the matter is, Mr. President, our people are seeking guidance on issues that are not only health related, but also have an economic impact on their life as well as their stability, and also as well as their ability to live a comfortable life here in this Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. So, Mr. President, I use this opportunity, and perhaps the Honorable Premier, as well as his colleagues, will enlighten us all during the substantive debate as to what economic stimulus package the NIA have put in place for the people of Nevis. These are the concerns that I bring to you, not only from my constituency, Mr. President, but from the general populace of Nevis. Um, yeah. When you started, um, you mentioned, you, fi you finished, right? You finished? Yes, Mr. President. Thank you. When you started, you indicated that uh, you had correspondence from the Premier on the COVID um, situation. From the point of view of the, the Island Assembly, that was a personal matter between yourself and the Premier. The Assembly or the, the, the Parliament was not part of it. Now, I would have thought, I would have thought that having gotten that bit of information to, for a meeting to discuss, that was a matter outside of Parliament. And it was for whatever was suggested and did not happen, it was for both parties to sort it out outside of parliament because the, it was not a parliamentary matter. It was a matter between the government and the opposition outside of parliament. And as such, I would have thought that that matter would not necessarily would have been brought to parliament. 
it is not a, it's a personal information outside of Parliament. And it was not only you who attended the meeting, you said um, the leader of the opposition, and so therefore it ought to have remained outside of Parliament. But you thought it best to bring it in? Fine. I allow you to, I was going to stop you, but I allow you to go on for me to explain to you um, the difference between um, personal explanation in terms of a matter that affects you personally. But you went on to say how it affects bus drivers and so forth based on that. That, that is something that could have been sorted out um, outside of personal explanations. President, uh, I, I had not intended to rise today to engage. Uh, my colleagues would have all spoken in the context of their statement by ministers. But under this head of personal explanations, the honorable member opposite has sought to engage in certain discussions here in the, in the House. And Whilst I appreciate that this house is, of course, controlled and managed by you, Mr. President, you have given some latitude. And what the honorable member opposite has said has now gone into the record because persons outside have heard and therefore would have for themselves heard what has passed as a personal explanation. I rise on one simple aspect of it because it is my firm view that matters that are raised at this stage ought not to be controversial and that if there are questions to be posed even in the parliamentary context that there is a mechanism for doing that, Mr. President, as you're well aware and as the member opposite should also be well aware that she can pose questions in the proper form to any member on this side of the house if she truly desires an explanation of something. But she raised this matter of the meeting. And whilst I share the view, Mr. President, I'm hopeful that you'll give me the latitude just to square the circle and just to give the House and the public the full information. The Honourable Member is absolutely correct that I have been inviting her and her party now for the past many weeks to be a part of the solution for this COVID-19 crisis. Absolutely correct. There has been an exchange of correspondence back and forth. There have been discussions back and forth. It culminated in a meeting, as she has described, between myself, the member opposite, and the leader of her party, all of whom attended, and I believe we met for some two hours, Mr. President. As a consequence of that meeting, when I specifically invited their partnership with the government on this issue, I received on June 9th, 2021, a formal letter that I have here. Not knowing what the Honorable Member would say, I have the letter with me. And I believe it's important for the House and for the public that the content of the letter, it's a short letter. It is dated June 9th. It's addressed to myself as Premier, and it says we COVID-19 joint partnership. The language is important because this is what I asked, extended my hand to the opposition and asked them to partner. The letter says, Mr. President, for the purposes of Hansard, as a follow-up to our meeting held on May 26, where you extended an invitation to the opposition to form a joint partnership in order to encourage the citizens and residents of Nevis to get vaccinated, I regret to inform you that the opposition has meticulously considered your proposal, but is unable to accept the offer at this juncture. The opposition will continue to do its part in creating awareness and sensitizing citizens about the COVID-19 virus and the available vaccine. We pray that your government will continue the education and awareness drive, whilst at the same time strive to strike a balance to ensure that the rights and freedoms of our people with regard to personal medical decisions are respected. 
Yours sincerely, Honorable Cleon Stapleton Simmons, member of the opposition in Evis 5. It had, I have been in possession of this since the 9th of June. I have never referred to it in public because I did think that it was a matter of dialogue, as you have explained, Mr. President, between the opposition and myself, and by extension, the cabinet. But the honorable member has seen it fit to come, and so she has come. And I believe it's important that the public understands that the hand of friendship and partnership that was extended on this issue, which for me leaves no room for politics, that that hand was not accepted. I will go further, since it is important to correct the record, that one of the recommendations that was made was that there be greater information sharing. And that information that came to me in my capacity as Premier should be shared with the opposition. And I have, notwithstanding the refusal to cooperate, notwithstanding the refusal of partnership, meticulously shared with the member opposite every scrap of information that has been shared with me. Whenever, Mr. President, I receive information on COVID, whether it has the vaccines, the updates, I forward it to the cabinet and I forward it to the honorable member opposite. Sometimes she acknowledges receipts, sometimes she doesn't. But I've made it a point to provide that information. I don't say this to cause controversy. I say it because it's important that the public understands that this government has done everything in its power to extend that hand of partnership and cooperation with the opposition because we recognize on this side that we're all in this together and that COVID is no respecter of persons or party. And I want to make that very clear for the record, Mr. President. I just wish to perhaps clarify one position, both for yourself for guidance purposes, as well as the honorable members opposite. Mr. President, in the first correspondence that we received from, that I, I received I, from the I, Premier. Please, I, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think that this is the time for this kind of um, effort. If for any reason you had an issue with anything that the Premier would have mentioned or discussed or what have you, and if you sought certain clarification as you indicated with the bus, if the bus drivers in Nevis are going to get the same treatment as the bus drivers in St. Kitts. The best way to go about it is to, for you to question, ask the question formally, in which case you would get a proper answer and submit it to the clerk, submit it to the clerk, and the clerk in turn would look at it made me aware of it, and then pass it on to the member that you're requesting the information from. That is uh, the best way and the proper way of asking certain questions. It's in the house. If you ask a question, you get up and ask a question, there's no guarantee that you would get a proper answer. But if you put it in writing, you give the person some time to do the research, it would be dealt with within a certain period of time at our next meeting. Um, I think I had enough of the back and forth because you get up now to, to clarify a matter which was discussed, which was mentioned earlier. The Premier got up and rebutted it and explained, and I think I had enough of that. And so the matter, as far as the personal explanation, is closed. Clerk, next. 
on the paper, the order paper. Introduction of bills and first readings. Mr. President, I rise to move the first reading of the bill shortly entitled the Nevis International Insurance Amendment Bill 2021. Mr. President, I rise to second the motion. The question is that the bill shortly entitled the Nevis International Assurance Ordinance Corporation Cap Ordinance Cap 7.07 be read the first time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against it? Those against? The ayes have it. A bill to amend the Nevis International Insurance Ordinance 7.07 .07 and for matters related thereto or connected therewith. The bill has been read the first time. President, I rise to move the motion and have read for the first time the Nevis Building Contractors Registration and Regulation Bill 2021. President, I rise to second the motion. Question is that the bill shortly entitled the Nevis Construction Commission Ordinance be read the first time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The eyes have it. A bill to provide for the establishment of a construction commissioner, the registration of building contractors, the regulation of building contractors, and for related or incidental matters. The bill has been read a first time. Public business. Bill second and third readings. Mr. President, I rise to move a motion that the bill shortly entitled Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority Bill 2021 be read a second time. Mr. President, it has become necessary for us to put in place an adequate solid waste management structure. And this is in order to protect the environment and the overall public health. 
of this country. And in order for us to accomplish this, we have come today because it is necessary for us to have the relevant legislation in place to properly manage the activities of an effective solid waste management authority. And so for that very reason, we have come to make some adjustments to the governing ordinance. This ordinance, Mr. Pre Mr. President, had its first reading before this honorable house a few months ago. And it was established then that the Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority ordinance came into force on January 1st, 2003, and that it was modeled from the St. Christopher and Nevis Solid Waste Management Corporation Act of 1996. This particular ordinance established the Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority and gave it the responsibility for solid waste collection, storage, treatment, and disposal over here on Nevis. It has been 19 years since this ordinance has been operational, Mr. President, and so we have come today to revise, update this particular ordinance. And so we seek to amend the ordinance, and, but we do it against the backdrop of a number of challenges. We have seen an increase in solid waste generation on Nevis. We have seen that we have outgrown our present site. And so disposal at some, t at some point in time, Mr. President, becomes inadequate. We have experienced low collection rates and we have also been faced with indiscriminate disposal all around the country. And so we have come to tighten up on these areas and to manage all the other challenges that we have at the authority. Nevis as we know it today is changing and it's changing rapidly. And I want to believe, Mr. President, that it is due in part of how this country has been managed over the past years. Because it has been so ably managed by a team that has put people at the epicenter of its economic development, we have seen that more and more persons are getting cars because they can now afford to buy a car. We have seen and we, are, and we are witnessing a boom in the construction industry. More and more buildings are being built, more and more persons acquiring homes. And all in all, more people are acquiring amenities that they are now able to afford. And what this has caused, Mr. President, is the generation of more waste at our landfill site. And so, Mr. President, the bill before us today is the Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority Bill 2021, which seeks to repeal and replace the Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority Ordinance CAP 3.03 and to provide for the management of solid waste, including its collection, storage, and disposal in conformity with the best environmental practices and for matters related thereto or connected within, there, therein, therewith, sorry. Mr. President, the establishment of these policies are the responsibility of the Nevis Island administration. And so, in order for the authority to function as it ought, it behooves us to put these necessary protocols and policies in place. This ordinance, Mr. President, further seeks to implement a practical system 
that allows the authority to have full oversight of the management and the processes undertaken by this authority. I need to establish here, Mr. President, though, that even as we are here to repeal this, repeal and replace this ordinance, I want to turn to part three of the ordinance and look at number three, section three, the continuation of the authority to lend itself to, to continuity the section is saying that notwithstanding the repeal of the Navy Solid Waste Management Authority Ordinance, the Solid Waste Management Authority established by that ordinance and in existence before the coming into force of this ordinance shall continue to exist. So even as we are here, the runnings of the Solid Waste Management continues until this new ordinance would have gained its um, safe passage through this honorable house. Mr. President, as I stand here today, we have made amendments to a number of areas of this, to this bill. However, I would, in my presentation, seek to clarify and give some clarity to some salient areas that I would want persons to pay particular attention to. And so I turn now to part two, section four, which speaks to the functions of the, of the authority. We have a number of, of functions laid out under number four, but I want to pay special attention to a new number which we have inserted at this time, and that is number seven. Section seven, Mr. President, the authority shall, in the performance of its function, comply with the provisions of the Public Health Act, CAP 9.21, and any other enactment relating to public health and the environment. We are cognizant, Mr. President, that the inadequate disposal and management of solid waste can lead to a number of health risks. It can re lead to breeding sites for flies, mosquitoes, rodents, and the like. And these are serious transmitters of not only harmful, but deadly diseases. We are also aware, Mr. President, that the inadequate disposal of solid waste can also affect the quality of air around us. Some months ago, Mr. President, we suffered um, a fire at the landfill. I am not certain at this point if it was intentionally set or it was set by some other means. But in situations like these, when you have plastics and other um, materials being burnt, these could affect the quality of air at the landfill. And so we want to avoid such incidences because these could lead to breathing difficulties, especially among our seniors and among our very young. We have a number of children these days who are born or would have developed asthma and breathing in, um, issues. So we are trying to prevent that sort of thing. And we know the handling, the mishandling of our solid waste matters could cause incidents like these. We are also aware, even on a higher level, that waste matter that is not disposed of properly could leach into the soil, into the sea, and could destroy our ecosystem. That is something 
that we will not want to destroy at this time. All in all, Mr. President, we are trying to ensure that the solid waste is disposed of properly so that it does not create any additional risk to human health and safety. And so what we are saying in this section that we have just inserted is that there must be some collaboration between this ordinance and the, the, the persons who are going to execute this ordinance and the Public Health Act and the persons who are going to institute the Public Health Act so that they, they could be working together. There is some collaboration, there is some harmonization, and so when important decisions are being made that all the relevant parties, that is the, um, those um, technicians in health and those technicians in solid ways, that they would be on the same page. Presently, the arm of health that works closely with solid waste is the environmental health. And we are aware that they have some responsibility, most of the responsibility in terms of enforcing the legislation as it pertains to our environment. And so we want to see a close collaboration of these two entities moving forward. And hence, we would have, uh, have um, inserted this section for that very same reason, so that we can ensure that there is that collaboration between the two areas. Mr. President, I look as well at section 28, which speaks to unauthorized disposal of solid waste. Mr. President, I have come here year after year, and I have been beseeching and I have been begging persons to desist the illegal dumping and the indiscriminate dumping all over Nevis. We have not been a people who are not, um, what must I say? We, we, we don't have pride in the aesthetics of our country, but for some reason, we have gone into a state where we have practiced and we are now becoming pro at just dumping our waste wherever we feel. And I would have come on several occasions and I would have asked for persons to desist in doing that. So section 28 speaks to unauthorized disposal of solid waste. Sub subject to subsection two and section 27 of this ordinance, a person shall not deposit or knowingly cause to be deposited solid waste in or on any land, beach, foreshore, marine, waters, rivers, or river banks. But specifically, what I want to draw person's attention to, Mr. President, is the charges that are attached. And so in Section four, any person who contravenes subsection one of this section or any condition of a waste management license commits an offense and shall be liable upon conviction. In the case of an individual to a fine not less than $25,000, but not exceeding $50,000 or imprisonment of a term not less than six months and not exceeding two years. And in the case of a company, a fine of not less than $250. Thousand. 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 Sorry. Thank you. $250,000, but not exceeding $400,000 or imprisonment for a term not less than two years, but not exceeding four years. Mr. President, these figures might sound prohibitive, but we have made them prohibitive because we want persons to stop. We have been asking, we have done all the necessary things, we have put bins all over 
when groups ask for bins, we put bins in every location for free, for free. But yet, we still have those who want to, who feel that they are above the law and they will still break the law. So I'm appealing to those persons who continuously break the law by disposing of their waste matters illegally that we now have the legislation in hand and we, after today, we will be giving the persons who will enforce it every authority to do what they need to do. So, persons, a word to the wise is sufficient. Mr. President, as we move along and we look at section number 32, we speak to the prohibition on the importation of waste. No person shall import into the island of Nevis any waste other than waste governed by the Merchant Shipping Act, and it is laid out here. Cap 705 imported under conditions authorized by that act. Waste gathered on board any aircraft landing in the island of Nevis no earlier than 24 hours before the time of such landing. And so under this section, Mr. President, section num um, number 32, which speaks to the prohibition on the importation of waste, we have outlined there as well um, the consequences in terms of fines for persons who are found contravening this aspect of this legislation. Any person who imports any hazardous waste contrary to subsection one of this section commits an offense and shall be liable on summary conviction to a fine of not less than $650,000, but not exceeding $800,000, or imprisonment for a term of five years or both such fine both such fine and imprisonment. And then it also goes on to talk about um, any person who imports any waste other than hazardous waste in contravention of subsection one of this section commits an offense and shall be liable to these figures as well. And so we are trying to ensure that we cover all areas and so the, the penalties for such areas are put inside it so that people can see, they can understand that if you are caught doing these things that you will be penalized and you'll be penalized severely. From listening to these numbers, you will be penalized and penalized severely. Mr. President, I, as I said, I am looking at the new areas that have been inserted in this, this ordinance. And so I move to section 40, and it speaks to derelict, der, derelict, derelict vehicles, etc. And number two of section 40 states that the authority or an authorized officer may order a person referred to in subsection one, and subsection one says a person who owns a derelict vehicle or white goods or other scrap metal shall take such vehicle goods or scrap metal to an approved landfill site or another site approved for the purpose of managing such vehicles, goods, or scrap. And so section two qualifies section one by saying that the authority or an authorized officer may order a person referred to in subsection one to remove such vehicle within seven days by issuing an enforcement order. 
set out in Form C in the second schedule in this ordinance. Mr. President, timing is important. And we have seen all around Nevis vehicles parked on the sides of the roads, on empty lots, and things of that nature. And we are saying that if these are deemed as derelict vehicles, then a person authorized by the authority could have these vehicles removed in seven days. It goes on to say in number three, we are a person who owns a vehicle referred in subsection two, cannot be identified. The authority or an authorized officer shall affix the enforcement order on the vehicle that is required to be removed. And if on the expiry of seven days, such vehicle is not removed, the authority or an authorized officer shall arrange for the removal. In the past, notices would be given out, seven days, 10 days, and nothing happens. Well, we are now saying that in the first instance, there will be an order of seven days to remove that derelict vehicle. If it is not moved, and if the person, the authorized person who goes with the, 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 um, the ticket does not find the owner, then they will affix the enforcement order on the vehicle. And if after seven days it is still not moved, then the authority has permission or that authority, this ordinance gives the authority that permission to remove that derelict vehicle. So we are warning those persons who have their vehicles just parked around the place to take note that you will be required, if they are deemed derelict, to have them transported to the site where it ought to be. We prefer not to have these vehicles lying around for extended periods, Mr. President. They could become breeders or homes for rodents, for rats, and all those sort of things. They could take away from the aesthetics of the community. And so, Mr. President, we want to continue to have a clean Nevis because our livelihoods depend on this cleanliness, Nevis being a tourism destination. So we are working as well with our tourism ministry, another stakeholder in this fight towards keeping Nevis clean. And so, Mr. President, we are doing all that we could in revising this ordinance so that we can maintain a clean and healthy Nevis. Mr. President, that, sub, that section spoke to persons who are given authority. And so we move to section 49, which that section outlines who these persons would be. We will be instituting litter, litter wardens. And so 49 speaks to litter wardens, who they are, they will be given a written appointment via an instrument issued by the minister, and they will be charged with the responsibility of carrying out instructions as it pertains to the removal of derelict vehicles and other solid waste that appear around the country. So this would be um, a welcome addition and we are hoping that persons who would be identified would take this, this job very seriously because it is a serious job and we want them to do an excellent job at helping all of us to keep Nevis clean. It is the responsibility of all of us. We are just charged them with the, 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 the immediate responsibility 
to take out the to carry out the duties that we have set out in this ordinance. Mr. President, we are encourage, encouraging persons to keep their surroundings clean. Too, too often when you drive through the countryside, you see overgrown lots. And on those overgrown lots, um, scary for some of us, these overgrown lots are used as dump sites as well. Last year, we had an incident where um, I think it was Minister um, Jeffers, who would have, in his walking, would have identified some movements on, on, on an empty piece of lot. Yes, it was, the, 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 was owned by the persons, and they were using it as a dump site. That is totally unacceptable. And so when the, the, the technicians from Solid Waste and Environmental Health went in, what they saw there on that lot was atrocious. And sometimes when we see overgrown lots being um, grown, it is, they, are, they allow it, people allow it to be overgrown for a particular reason, to hide the fact that they are dumping in these areas. And so I want to continue to encourage persons to desist from doing that. The tipping fees at the, at the landfill are not prohibitive. Very, exactly, very, very affordable. When we were here the last time, we adjusted them by a few dollars or thereabout. But they are very affordable. And I am speaking specifically to persons who do haulage. They collect persons' monies from the businesses that they're doing haulage from. And then they are the culprits who would take this waste and dump it any place they want. I'm asking them to stop. And we are very adamant in holding this bill, this ordinance to the letter, because this nonsense must stop, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move along to section 52. And well, I just spoke um, to that in terms of vacant land to be kept clean. A person who owns or is in charge of vacant land shall keep that land clean and free of overgrown grass, bush, or trees, and shall not allow that land to be used as a place for the dumping of litter. And I just spoke to that, Mr. President, because it has been happening. It is not something new. It has been happening for a long time. And we have been trying. But to this day, we have not been able to curb it the way in which you would have liked. And I am saying that persons are intentionally allowing their lots to overgrow so that they can use them as dump sites. A litter warden may, in accordance with the provisions of section 48, issue a litter, a litter removal order to a person referred to in subsection one. And so I go back to say, Mr. Mr. President, that the, the duties of our litter wardens are very important duties, and we are hoping that those persons who will be selected um, to carry out this task will take this seriously. There are some persons who are outlined here already Every member of the board is a little warden. The general manager of the Solid Waste Management Authority is a little warden. The operations manager of the Solid Waste Management Authority, an environmental health officer, and a member of the police force. These are all laid out in here, in there. However, additional persons would be added to this list to carry out those duties. And as I would have said earlier, Mr. President, this, the, the, the whole um, coming together of environmental health and solid waste management is very important because those two arms of government are fully responsible for discharging the duties as it pertains to keeping Nevis clean. Mr. President, additionally, I want to say that in this ordinance, it allows the authority to be more creative. As I mentioned earlier, we have outgrown the space at the landfill. And so 
with this new ordinance gives the, uh, give the authority some flexibility in considering other ways of um, waste disposal, whether it's incineration, whether it's um, re, um, recycle, recycling, what else? There are other, other means available, and so this new ordinance would give them the flexibility to look at the other areas so that we can curb the, the overgrowing or the, 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 the fact that we have um, now outlived the usefulness of the, the landfill. However, until such time, we will need to, and I think the management has been looking feverishly for new lands, available lands. I don't know if the Minister of Lands have any lands that are not arable lands or not worthy of building homes that we can use for, to construct a new landfill. But very shortly, th that is an area we will have to look at, even if it is at a smaller scale, and then we will also employ the other, um, other avenues of dealing with our waste. And so that is something that the, the um, management is looking at, at right now. Mr. President, as I mentioned earlier, the, this ordinance, we would have looked at some of the new areas, I would have looked at some of the new areas that were not in the older ordinance, and I think I would have covered, covered them this morning, Mr. President. And so I would like to commend the management of the Solid Waste Management Authority and his staff, the manager, sorry, who is in the gallery, and I'm happy that he would have come to give his support, as well as the representative from the Ministry of Health who sits on that board. I must commend the management manager and his team for the fantastic job that he has been doing under some real challenging situations. We, we are cognizant that the management of solid waste has to compete with other pressing economic and social issues. And so they have done excellently given the parameters that they have to work with and the financing that they have available. So I commend them highly. And especially in this pandemic time, the workers at the Solid Waste Management Authority are out there every day, and I am yet to get a complaint that even in the lockdowns that they would have missed one day in terms of doing their collections. So I want to say to them that they are valued by us as a government, their service, service is valued, the persons out there are giving them high praise and commendation, and I want to say to them, thank them immensely for the job that they have been doing. I also want to commend very highly the chairman and the board who are so ably giving the support and the guidance to the management, management team. I want to thank them for their valuable service and contributions. And I want to say that with the challenges that we have faced, I want to believe today that with the passage of this new ordinance, that they will be given the latitude, they will be given the autonomy, they will be given the scope to operate in the way that they ought to. With these brief remarks, Mr. President, I would like to wish this bill a safe passage through this honorable house. May it please you.
Mr. President, I rise to, in the first instance, second the motion that is before this Honorable House, the Navy Solid Waste Management Authority Bill, and also to lend my support to this bill. I want to commend, Mr. President, the mover of this bill for the important work that this piece of legislation seeks to do here on the island of Nevis. Uh, with your permission, Mr. President, I want to read a few extracts. One such extract, Mr. President, is from the World Bank page. And with your permission, and I want to read it, Mr. President, into the record of this Honorable House. Compared to those in developed nations, residents in developing countries, especially the urban poor, are more severely impacted by unsustainable managed waste. In low-income countries, over 90% of waste is often disposed in unregulated dumps or openly burned. These practices create serious health, safety, and environment, environmental consequences. Poorly, management, poorly managed waste service as a breeding ground for disease vectors contributes to global climate change through methane generation and can even promote urban violence. The article went on to state, managing waste properly is essential for building sustainable and livable cities. But it remains a challenge for many developing countries and cities. Effective waste management is expensive. This is coming from the World Bank. Often comprising 20% to 50% of municipal budgets. Mr. President, the article also went on to state that in Argentina, some $40 million in loans and grants help to reduce and properly treat food waste through partnership with food banks and retailers. We have closed over 70 dump sites and construct 11 waste facilities in Argentina. But I want to come a little closer home, Mr. President, to St. Martin. And this is coming from the World Bank. In St. Martin, the World Bank is providing a $25 million grant. You hear the word, Mr. President? Grant for emergency debris management with a focus on dump site management, in addition to broader sectoral support. There is ongoing support to develop a national solid waste management strategy. And I believe that Nevis is way ahead in terms of developing their solid waste management strategy. In Jamaica, community participation and waste collection serves Eighteen communities through result-based financing and infrastructure development. Waste activities also led to job creation and contributed to a crime prevention and reduction program. So, Mr. President, what we are doing here in this honorable house can have far-reaching implication on our island and our economy. And I would move further, Mr. President, to extract from the International Journal on Environmental Research and Public Health. Environmental contamination due to solid waste mismanagement is a global issue. Open dumping and open burning are the main implemented waste treatment and final disposal system mainly visible in low-income countries. The Environmental Research and Public Health article went on to state, 
the implementation of sound waste management collection and disposal practices, involvement of manufacturers and behavior change are key aspects of any solutions. And I believe once again, Mr. President, that here on the island of Nevis, we are moving in that direction. Mr. President, in a document provided by Camille Ramparine, I hope I get that name right, an environmental consultant who did a study on the Navy solid waste management and provided a report in 2018. In section 4.8 of that report, Mr. President, the author states, the Waste Management Committee should undertake or oversee the development of a Navy's waste management strategy. This will allow the island to set targets for diversion, recycling, and disposal. The strategy will also focus on any legislation that needs updating, address capacity development, examine financing of major components of a Nevis waste management strategy. And I believe, Mr. President, that that is why we are here in this honorable house today, to move forward the Nevis solid waste management strategy. And I want to focus very briefly on three sections of the bill, Mr. President. Part three and section 16, three. Part three, section 16, three where it reads, the Nevis Solid Waste Management Strategy, there we go again, shall, in particular, without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing, and it lists a number of strategic approach, Mr. President. One, implement standards and procedures for the reduction, recycling of, recovery, reclaiming and reuse of waste and use of recycling, recycled substances. And Mr. President, see that word recycled, recycling? This piece of legislation, I believe, would give greater teeth to recycling here on the island of Nevis. And I want to say to the young business entrepreneur here on the island of Nevis, recycling of waste is big business. Let me say it again, recycling of waste is big business. And there are available funds globally for any entrepreneur who wish to get involved in recycling of waste. And I want to encourage our young people to think seriously about recycling of waste here on the island of Nevis and get involved in such a business. The Nevis Solid Waste Management Strategy, Part B, identify methods by which all types of waste are to be managed. And there again, Mr. President, this should include recycling. It goes on to, in part C, identify methods by which solid waste is to be transported. And I want to pause there. Because we have had untold problems here on the island of Nevis with persons transporting waste and the traffic department and solid waste have, in, have encouraged the movers of waste to cover their vehicle to ensure that they do so in a manner that is safe not only for themselves but also for other road users. So the management strategy shall implement, Mr. President, methods through which uh, solid waste is transported. They will also establish standards and procedures for the location of a waste disposal site and facilities. And out of this report, Mr. President, the Honorable Mover would have said to us that the waste site have long passed its sell-by date. And it is, in my mind, of great urgency to find a new waste site here on the island of Nevis. 
Mr. President, I want to move very quickly to part four, section 21. Part four, section 21. And it speaks to waste management licenses and permits. And Mr. President, there is a, I want to read the first section, part one. For the purpose of determining the environmental impact which might arise out of any new or significantly modified construction, processes, works, or other activity respect of solid waste management facility, the authority shall designate a list of activities which an, which an express grant of permission from the planning authority and an environmental impact assessment is required. Mr. President, it is critically important that for any development on the island of Nevis that will generate a significant quantum of waste that there must be an environmental impact assessment done to know exactly what impact on the environment that those activities will have. And I'm happy, Mr. President, that this legislation adds a bit more teeth to the environmental impact assessment as it regards to the generation of waste. Mr. President, if the authority requires an impact assessment, and if someone is granted the permission, and if, Mr. President, that person does not follow the guidelines of that Im environmental impact assessment, there is some stiff penalties here. I see $25,000. Let me say it again, $25,000. And they went a little further, $65,000. And they even went a little further, six months, but not exceeding two years of both fines and imprisonment. This is serious, Mr. President, as it regards to the protection of our environment here on the island of Nevis. I want to move very quickly to part seven, section 53. The mover would have already highlighted section 52 as it regards to vacant land. But I want to highlight section 53 as it regards to dilapidated buildings, Mr. President. You see, we all know that in the 50s and 60s and 70s, many of our people would have journeyed overseas and they would have left their property here on the island of Nevis. A lot of those properties, Mr. President, have turned into a state of disrepair and are now dilapidated. Oh, Mr. President, those buildings are creating a significant problem for us here on the island of Nevis. This piece of legislation is saying to the owners of those dilapidated buildings, and it's sounding a warning to them. And I want to read, Mr. President, a few excerpts from section 53 of this legislation. Part one, after obtaining the approval of the director of the Nevis Physical Planning Department, a little warden shall issue an enforcement order set out as form C in the schedule, in the second schedule of this ordinance to the owner, occupier, or person in charge of a building that has become dilapidated, ruinous, injurious to health, or unfit for human habitation, requiring any of those persons, as the case may be, to demolish the building specified in the enforcement order to the satisfaction of the little warden. Now, Mr. President, let me say it again. This is serious business. 
And I want to say to all and sundry persons who have these dilapidated buildings all over the island, that there will now be a process that the little ones can take to have these dilapidated buildings demolished. And Mr. President, it is not because that we just want to knock down people's buildings. These dilapidated buildings are creating some problems. They are creating sanctuary for crime and criminality. And let us speak frank. Let us talk plain, as we would say. A lot of these dilapidated buildings are nurseries for vectors that can spread disease in our communities. Rodents that continue to create major problems for our healthcare professionals, Mr. President. And I'm saying that all those persons who are under the sound of my voice in this honorable house at this time, that this government is taking very seriously the protection of our environment very seriously and the disposal of waste and garbage very seriously, Mr. President. I want to commend once again, Mr. President, the mover of this bill. And I want to also join with her and commend the manager, the board of directors, for the sterling work that they continue to do here on the island of Nevis under difficult and trying circumstance. While everyone else is locked down, Mr. President, garbage is still being collected and disposed of. And I want to commend them for that. I want to also, Mr. President, commend the entire cabinet for recognizing the importance of ensuring that we dispose of our garbage in a proper manner and giving teeth to this piece of legislation. I hope and I believe, Mr. President, that the Solid Waste Authority would now use every tool that is available to them to protect our environment and protect livelihood here on the island of Nevis. Mr. President, with those few words, I want to wish this bill safe passage to this honorable house. Mr. President, I rise to make my contribution on the debate for the resolution that is before us. Mr. President, I must say that I am a bit disappointed for the meeting in the House today because, Mr. President, one perhaps would have hoped that coming out of a lockdown, a week lockdown, where we had uh, at least three days of a uh, 24-hour curfew, as well as um, two days of uh, restricted curfew, as well as at least three weeks or four weeks of a uh, community spread of the COVID-19 virus in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis that we perhaps would have come to the house today to put a stimulus package in place for the citizens of Nevis. Nevertheless, Mr. President, we are here again to talk about waste. From my limited experience in the House, it appears to me that every time we come to the House, we are speaking about waste. And not to say that waste, management of waste, particularly solid waste, is not important, Mr. President. But at a time like this, one would have hoped that the health and the economic well-being of the people of Nevis would have been priority on the agenda of this government. 
But that is not the case, Mr. President. So, as I go through this bill, I must say, the first observation, Mr. President, is that the bill is, is somewhat of a, a procedural, standard procedural legislation. There is nothing, in my respectful opinion, progressive about this bill. It does not, in my respectful opinion, Mr. President, encourage innovation in research or technologies to manage solid waste in this digital era. You would have heard it from the very mover of the bill. And as well as the member for number one in his support for the resolution stated quite clearly that the facility that we have presently at the solid waste over at Long Point that we perhaps would have surpassed that facility and there is a need for either expansion or a separate facility so that we can adequately manage waste. The question for the members opposite, what is stopping the government from putting this infrastructure in place? I do not know, I would leave it for them to respond accordingly. So again, I am yet invited to the House in the middle of a global pandemic, in the middle of suffering and Christ from our people that perhaps are falling on deaf ears because the government have a policy to ignore the noise and keep the momentum. But in doing so, Mr. President, it is my fear that the sad noise consists of the cries of our people, the cries and suffering of our people for some sort of economic relief. And so, Mr. President, let us then since, since it is an agendered priority, let us talk about waste. I hope, Mr. President, that the waste that we continue to speak about in this honorable house is not synonymous with waste of time, waste of resources, and also wastage on good corporate governance. But I would leave that, Mr. President, for the powers that be. And so, Mr. President, having read the draft bill that is put before this Honorable House, I have a few questions for the mover of the bill as it relates to specific sections of the bill, Mr. President. So, first and foremost, I would like to know what is meant by clinical waste. I see it in the interpretation section. And with your permission, Mr. President, I wish to quote, clinical waste means any part of the human body, including tissues or bodily fluids, but excluding fluids extracted, teeth, hair, nails, clippings, and the like, that are not infectious. So therefore, Mr. President, perhaps it would have been prudent to go on and give a explanation or a synopsis as to what are the type of fluids that the, 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 the bill is perhaps speaking about or referring to. That would have, would have certainly helped. Nevertheless, Mr. President, as we continue, I wish to take you to section four, and I wish to ask the mover of the bill that what really are the concrete plans to deal with the mountain of waste that is presently growing and increasing at the dump site? Is there any plans to recover any re recyclable material? 
What about the area outside the solids waste, which material has been pushed into the sea? And a number of persons living in the, the area have been complaining about the waste pollution that is directly de deriving from the solid waste space right there. Mr. President, the fishermen at BAT have been complaining. We have admitted here, Mr. President, we know the dump site is almost a tower high where garbage expend through winds, particularly when we have high winds, and they dissip dissipate all over the country in the surrounding areas. Let us not talk about the flies, Mr. President, but that's another matter. And so here it is that we are coming to put our legislative framework in place, but we have no plans. We have not laid out any plans for the infrastructure development, any concrete plans to deal with the infrastructure of solid waste management in this country. And we have come to this house at least, if my memory serves me right, three times to deal with solid waste. So Mr. President, I do not know where we are really going with this, but I was taught my grandmother to see the good in every single bad situation. And so I wish to commend the mover of the bill for section 17. Where perhaps we now, for the very first time, have seen some intervention by the implementation of our public review strategy. I think this is a good move on behalf of the government. However, Mr. President, I'm very mindful that because there is a requirement or a condition for there to be, for the strategy to be gazetted in the official gazette, that perhaps one can foresee some bureaucratic limitations or obstructions as it relates to this in a very practical sense, Mr. President. But nevertheless, I think it was a, a good thought to include a public, public review strategy in the bill. Mr. President, as we continue, I have some questions about the composition of the board. And I noticed that the minister, and I'm not sure, I do seek guidance and clarification as to whether it is the substantive minister or the junior minister. That was not made very clear in the legislation. If I overlooked it, I stand to be corrected. But Mr. President, as it was the junior minister who moved, was the mover of the bill, I assume Minister there perhaps is referring to the junior minister. Um, Mr. President, I, I ask, or I have noticed that the minister has quite a lot of power in terms of determining the composition of the board or the authority as it is coined in the legislation. And there are a number of references made as it relates to uh, being able to employ a general manager as well as a operations manager. It even gives details of the minister's intervention and quite so with some latitude as it relates to salaries. So I want to know if it is that it is the minister alone who would make the considerations as it relates to these, or whether as the corporation is intended to be a quasi-public corporation, whether 
the government's HR department would have some influence and some say in terms of the overarching management. Those are things, Mr. President, that perhaps were not necessarily made clear in this legislation. Mr. President, I notice in the interpretation section, white goods were defined to the extent that it included abandoned refrigerators, washing machines, and domestic appliances. And quite, to be quite honest, these are normally the things that people would perhaps dispose of illegally. But I would also like the mover of the bill to also consider adding perhaps computers, printers, cell phones, CCTV cameras, and such other engineering hardware that may very well fit within that category. Mr. President, it also states, and I believe it is section two, that no person shall carry out any of the functions of the authority in paragraphs A to G of subsection one without the consent of the authority in a form determined by the minister and published in the official gazettes. Mr. President, I can see that we may have some difficulty in this particular section, just the way that it is coined, because this could lead to significant bottleneck and bureaucratic delays once again. Why is there a need for it to be published in the Gazette? Perhaps the mover can give a greater explanation. The very fact that we have these bureaucratic delays and, and somewhat a bit of bottlenecking, bottlenecking, it therefore means that the authority really doesn't have any real authority in the true sense, simply because there is another hurdle of there being the need for it to be gasseted. Mr. Speaker, if I go on, the act also states that the authority, meaning the corporation or board, whatever you want to coin it, the mover would have alluded to the fact that this piece of legislation caters for the continuance of the existing board. I do hope that is the way that I understood it, and therefore I have, I have presented it that way, but if, if that is not the case, I stand to be corrected. And subsection seven reads, the authority shall, in the performance of its functions, comply with the provisions of the Public Health Act and other enactment relating to public health and the environment. And so we would notice that in the composition of the management team, or uh, the proposed management team under section five, subsection two, we note that the board of directors can be comprised of at least five directors, but no more than seven directors, including the following members. Senior representative of the Ministry of Health, senior representative of the Environmental Health Department, a general manager who would also serve as a secretary to the board. But there is no mention of uh, the director of physical planning being a compulsory board member of this authority. And as the seconder of the bill quite interestingly pointed out, that included in this piece of legislation is also the provision for litter wardens who now have the authority in order to deal with um, 
not only litter abatement, but also dilapidated buildings. And so one would have thought that it perhaps could have proven to be prudent to include the director of physical planning as a compulsory member of uh, the authority or the corporation, the board of the corporation. Again, that is a matter for the mover of the bill to take into consideration. Mr. President, I have looked at, I believe it's section 18, bear with me. Just want to get to the fine section 32. And so we are looking at the prohibition of on the importation of waste. And Mr. President, I do agree with the mover of the bill that waste, it is a problem, we cannot deny that. And it is something that must be controlled. But like I said, Mr. President, without the proper facility and infrastructure in place, it leaves one to wonder, how will we be able, how would the government, sorry, be able to enforce the measures outlined in this piece of legislation if the basic physical infrastructure is not in place for them to be able to do so? And so, the spirit of this legislation comes across again as a bit harsh, a bit oppressive, because here it is, in this time, the priority again, Mr. Speak, Mr. President, is to impose fines and taxation on our people when the government once again have failed to put the necessary infrastructure in place. It is not my doing. They have admitted it quite openly and frankly in moving this piece of legislation in the House. And so it seems like this government continue to repeat itself in always putting the cart before the horse. And we have seen it, not only in solid waste, we have seen it even in terms of the whole dealing of this pandemic. We have seen little or no attention being placed on an economic recovery plan. I was hoping when I received the notice last week Thursday, I said, yes, finally, the government has wake up and they are going to now put a plan in place to deal with how Nivisions will continue to cope with COVID because we must and how this government is going to ensure that our people have a smooth transition as we continue to deal with this pandemic and we aspire to go towards the full reopening of our economy. We are not seeing that, Mr. President. All we hear is that vaccinate, vaccinate, and vaccinate. And the opposition should join with the government and collaborate and encourage people to vaccinate. And whilst vaccination is important, Mr. President, and don't get me wrong, it is very, very important. And I wish to use this forum to say to the people, Mr. President, that once you have made that decision and you have consulted your doctor, that that is something that you are to take into consideration and proceed to do. So, Mr. President, there is no issue here with the vaccination. I am just simply saying that there must be a balance. I have said it in this Honorable House before. As a matter of fact, my first entry into this honorable house on April 18th, 2020, when this government, despite the federal government introducing 
a state of emergency in the federal parliament, they saw the need to come into this honorable house on a Saturday unprecedentedly to ensure that that mechanism was put in place in this honorable house. We had another state of emergency imposed recently, implemented recently in the federal parliament. But to much to my surprise, there was no need to do the same in Nevis by this government. Matters for consideration, Mr. President. And so, here we are again. Waste is a priority, but the people of Nevis, the people who are seeking for some sort of economic stimulus, the bus driver, my constituent, who have asked, well, what would happen to Nevisions? Is the stimu stimulus package that the Prime Minister so eloquently outlined and made sure to mention the people of St. Kitts, but not necessarily the people of Davis. People are left to wonder now, in the heart of this pandemic, whether there would be any economic relief or stimulus package to give them some sort of ease during this very hard and trying times. And so we await for that. Perhaps it might take another parliamentary sitting in order for the government to put those facility in place. I note, Mr. President, that the junior minister of health is very intrigued and somewhat eager about solid waste management. And I do agree with her because it is a problem and it should be fixed. And I do believe that it would make a significant contribution towards improving the health and safety of individuals and residents. However, one must ask the minister this question, either the junior or the substantive, what about the health care, the health now of the people of Nevis? We have not had a report about the extension facility or wing at the Alexandra Hospital. I believe, Mr. President, it is still under construction. And so we are still waiting, awaiting that. I know the honorable member for Nevis too. In his recent press release, he stated that plans are coming along well, that the, there needs to be some consultation as it relates to the design of the interior of the building. And so it leaves one to wonder, how is it that the government would have exhausted so much resources in terms of doing this expansion, having the engineer design plans, but yet still we have to have a separate consultation now to deal with the inside of the building. Mr. President, in Lemon's term, how any ordinary individual would understand this? If you build a house and you hire an architect to design your house, would the architect not be able, or the engineer, whoever, not be able to deal with the design plan for the inside as well as the outside of the facility simultaneously? Again, the very fact that we have to go back now to look at the interior design of a building that was designed to be the extension of a hospital it tells me, Mr. President, without the government saying it, that there were indeed some wastage. And so, perhaps it is fitting that we always come into this honorable house to discuss solid waste and wastage. Now, Mr. President, as we move forward, as we move forward, Mr. President, do not, do not point your finger at any one member on this side. Mr. President, if I may, and 
I am not sure if I am permitted to speak about this publicly, but perhaps with your leave, I can do so. Now, Mr. President, it is no secret that I am the lone member on the opposition benches. I believe you and I would have had a private one-to-one -one discussion where we would discuss the, the formalities, so to speak, of the House. But, Mr. President, whether it is one person, two persons, three persons, I believe that the opposition benches should be treated with some level of respect in this honorable house. I believe that I do give it to the members opposite. And so, through you, Mr. President, because you are the authority within this parliament, I do seek and crave the same indulgence, Mr. President. Now, as I continue, Mr. President, with a few questions, I therefore ask, Mr. President, if there is any plans to deal with the recycling of old and abandoned vehicles. Mr. President, you yourself are having a difficulty in hearing me and following me. I know I am having difficulty in even hearing myself, but if that is the way it should be, Mr. President, if it's, that is what you are permitted to allow, I am respectfully guided by you, Mr. President. Never, nevertheless, Mr. President, the mover of the bill, I ask if there are any plans to deal with the recycling of abandoned, um, dilapidated vehicles. I know that was mentioned in, bear with me as I find this, this section, Mr. President. Okay, I know it was mentioned in the bill, but Mr. President, there wasn't a strategic focus in terms of giving us an idea as to what type of technology or infrastructure would be put in place to deal with not only the collection of abandoned vehicles, but what would happen thereafter at, at the end product. Where will these abandoned vehicles, and of course the white wastage, where will they be stored, and are there any plans for recycling of, of, of these said instruments, um, Mr. President? The bill perhaps did not allude to that in any clear terms, and that is something that the mover of the bill may wish to consider in terms of adding specifically what plans and how these items will be specifically treated. I do commend the effort, Mr. President, as I can see some improvement from where we, are, we were at the, the, the last bill. However, without the proper infrastructure in place, it is somewhat more of just um, a procedural a procedural mechanism, and it, it does not really bring life towards any prospect of really seriously putting some deliberate thought into solid waste management and effective recycling that can create jobs for people and make a, a significant contribution towards the scope of dealing with green energy. Mr. President, whilst the government spent a lot of time in ensuring that the procedure in, was in place, I think we needed a bit more outline or outreach of the substantive, of the procedure of, of the recycling, of creating jobs. I am not seeing that effort being put into the conservation of 
green energy in this particular piece of legislation, Mr. President. Now, Mr. President, with your permission, I would like to take a few minutes to speak about, or perhaps to ask the mover of the bill, now that we have a section in this particular legislation that deals with litter abatement, are there any infringements or any overlapping in terms of the substantive health legislation, where, which also made provision for litter wardens? I am not sure how the federal legislation and this ordinance will, will really work hand in hand, but um, perhaps greater explanation can be given by any subsequent mover of the bill because these are things that really are to be considered, Mr. President. Now, Mr. President, I, I notice that Section 22, I believe it is, speaks about waste management license. And so I'm not sure is the, if there is a difference between the waste management license and the waste hall license. I'm not sure if it is one and the same thing, but the words are used um, somewhat interchangeably where there's a license and then there is a hall waste permit as expressed in sections 22 and 23. I'm not sure if that is by design, but what I do know and what I see clearly from the legislation, Mr. President, is that a, a register should be maintained and the public can inspect the register again at a fee of 30, I take it that is, it is, um, it is um, 35 EC dollars. No explanation about currency, but as this is an easy con um, country, I suppose it is Eastern Caribbean dollars. Mr. President, I also would like to, to ask the mover of the bill in relation to the associated fines. Is it assumed that the approval of the waste strategy would pre be preceded by the necessary infrastructure to manage the receipt of waste of oil from garages and service stations? Again, no mention made there, but that is something that perhaps the, the mover of the bill could take into consideration and give some explanations as it relates to, to those sections. Now, Mr. President, I note that the bill also gives the, the corporation or the body authority the power to borrow monies over $25,000, and I assume once again that that is easy which shall be exercisable only with prior approval from the minister in consultation with the minister of finance. And so here it is, we see that the board has a somewhat of a limited budget of $25,000 um, cap for borrowing. And one perhaps would ask the question of if we are serious about solid waste management and the technology of being able to recycle and have a, a modern infrastructure in place to deal with solid waste management. If the mover of the bill feels that a limit of $25,000 is sufficient in order for us to carry out the ambitions as coined in this legislation. And so, one would think that perhaps a bit more is needed if we are going to be serious about solid waste in this country. And so, Mr. President, it, it clearly shows that, again, some further thoughts 
and planning would have proven to, to be prudent and beneficial because just from the spirit and the reading of this piece of legislation, it is clear that the government is not serious about solid waste management, about the green energy technology, about recycling in this country. And so one has to ask the question as to what it is that this government is really serious about. We are left with, again, more questions than answers. And so I think we perhaps need to go back a bit to the drawing board. And if I can give a bit of advice to the members opposite, that perhaps the time has come for them to stop putting the cart before the horse and for them to consider ensuring that as a government, they do effective planning and research. You have to put the infrastructure in place so that the people of the country know which direction you are moving in. This piece, 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 bits and pieces of governance really has to stop, Mr. President. It is not serving the best interest of the people of the country. Because I can foresee, Mr. President, from this, that even if this bill is successfully passed, that before the year is end, we are going to be back in this very house again to pass another piece of solid waste legislation. And so maybe, maybe, Mr. President, it might be best to sit down collectively, plan your approach, plan which direction you want to go, take into consideration the economic objectives of the managing solid waste effectively in this country and come to the house, come to the people of Nevis with a comprehensive and solid plan that all of us can have confidence in, Mr. President. We are yet to see that. And so, Mr. President, I believe, I commend the efforts, but I believe we are still a long way away from perhaps having a sensible and deliberate approach to solid waste management in this country. We are still some, some time away, Mr. That, President. That, that word sensible is not a word I would wish for you to, 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 to say um, because of the connotations it would imply. I just want you to sit up. Grateful, Mr. President. I, I will withdraw it. And uh, no insult intended, but the word was perhaps used, for lack of a better word, to show that there is no planning and no deliberate consideration for moving the country forward, even through solid waste management, Mr. President. I thank you. That is the extent of my contribution. Okay. Let, let me just pick up something on what you would have said earlier. And this is just for you to think about and probably, probably use it down the road. You would have asked a number of questions pertaining different aspects of the legislation. But unfortunately, it is quite possible that when the minister comes to wrap up, she just fly past. And so you would not necessarily have gotten an answer to some of the questions you pose. What if you put whatever question you have in writing to the minister or any member, to the member, whichever member, um, so that they can do the research and come up with, with that response. It would mean, therefore, that the 
order of the, the, the order of the house would be so guided where we have questions and answers. By so doing, you would be able to get a proper answer to any question that you are looking answers to. I thought I would just say it for whatever it is worth. Thank you. Mr. President, with your leave, I rise to make a brief contribution to the bill before this honorable house. But Mr. President, as I sat there and I listened to the contribution from the member opposite, I'm a little bit in awe. I am. Because when the member opposite, Mr. President, could come to this honorable house and even suggest that this government, this competent and capable and caring government is wasting time by coming in here to talk about solid waste. Mr. President, how could we be wasting time? I want to ask the member opposite, if your garbage isn't picked up for a week, how would you feel? If the garbage in your constituency is not picked up for two weeks, how would they feel? Do you know how much sickness that can cause? You come here and say we should be talking about health and well-being. That is health and well-being we are here to talk about. We are talking about health and well-being when we are talking about solid waste. So how could you come here and say that we should be talking about health and well-being and we should be talking about stimulus? We're talking about stimulus since last year, Mr. President. This is a government that has been talking about stimulus since the pandemic. I mean, when we talk about stimulus, when you talk about the agriculture industry, you, you heard the, the agriculture minister. You know how much stimulus the agriculture industry got? When you talk about moratorium, when the premier went to the banks, people got moratorium on their loans. There was moratorium on electricity and water rates. We put something in place to waive alien and holding license. You know how much um, properties have passed hands since that? Do you know what's happening in the construction industry with the stimulus that we provided? Do I need to go on? Do you know how much stimulus has come since MSR Media has come? I'm wondering, Mr. President, I'm wondering if, if the member opposite lives in Nevis. No, I don't think so. Is either that or she's in a coma since last year? Because if anybody who lives in Nevis could say that this government has not provided a stimulus. Something has to be wrong. Very wrong. And so for her to come here in this honorable house today to suggest that we are wasting time to speak about solid waste, something is wrong, Mr. President. I am here today to commend the mover of this bill and to commend this bill. Because we have to talk about solid waste, Mr. President. You can't have livelihoods without lives. Yes. And you can't have lives unless the lives are healthy. Yes. And when you talk about solid waste and what we are trying to do, is because we want health and wellness in the nation. You want health and wellness in the nation? You can't be, you can't be doing something. You can't go to work to, today, Mr. President, and be, be productive unless you're healthy. Can you? And how are you going to be healthy? Because we're putting we put in things in place which, with, with, with um, solid waste for us to have a healthy nation. We have talked about how efficient solid waste has been in this nation, how good they have been operating. And we continue to commend the manager there and the entire staff. They've done an outstanding job. Nobody can complain and say that the garbage is not being picked up. All during the lockdown. The last time we were here, I think I said that my garbage in my area is picked up like three days a week. 
Where else in the region you're going to find that? Where else? So for you to say that we are wasting time to come here to talk about solid waste, I think you owe your constituents and your party and the whole of Nevis an apology to come here to suggest that. You owe them an apology. And I believe that your constituents are very disappointed in you today to come here to suggest that we are wasting time to talk about solid waste. Mr. President, <laughs> I don't know if any of the constituents are in here, but Mr. President, I, I really want to just briefly support this legislation, this speech of legislation, when we look at section 28, the mover would have spoken about indiscriminate dumping. And I had to get up to speak, Mr. President, because indiscriminate dumping is a huge, massive problem on the island of Nevis. Massive problem. And when I looked at the legislation, Mr. President, and I looked at the fines that will be levied at persons who are engaging in indiscriminate dumping, I commend the persons who put this legislation together. We need some heavy fines. We need money in the treasury. And when the member opposite could come and suggest that the, we are too harsh, could you imagine that? We are too harsh when we're trying to keep Nevis clean? We are too harsh with the penalties? We are doing this because we want to deter people from dumping? We want to keep Nevis pristine. Nevis is a tourist destination, and apart from that, we have to keep it clean for ourselves. Exactly. We have to keep it clean for ourselves first. And so Nevis must remain clean, pristine, and healthy for those of us who live here. That's the only way we can lead healthy lives. And so the fines, I believe, Mr. President, are in order. People need to be made a public example of. And when people can go and indiscriminately dump things. I was sitting in my office a couple of days, um, I think a couple of weeks ago. A young lady called me and she said, I was driving around the island and she was pointing out to me all the areas where people were dumping. And she said, Lord, Mr. Evelyn, a shame. When I see these things, a shame. I think she eventually called the manager of the Solid Waste Management Authority as well. And he would have organized to send some trucks there to pick up some of this stuff. A couple of months ago, a gentleman called me, said he went up Saddle Hill. All the way up a Saddle Hill, people are going to go dump. Could you imagine that? Shameful. Our people are not supposed to be like this. We should have pride of place, Mr. President, and pride in our little nation. And as the mover said, the tipping fees are cheap, dirt cheap, dirt cheap, Mr. President. Everybody who would have used the services of solid waste know that the, 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 the tipping fees are dirt cheap. And for truckers to take people's money, and I want to make it clear as well because I think it's in the legislation here, that when persons hire somebody to carry the, the garbage to the dump, and the person does not take the garbage to the dump, the person who is hiring becomes liable as well. And so people must realize now that this government is serious about keeping Nevis clean, keeping our environment clean, keeping the place healthy for all of us to live in. The wealth of a nation depends on the health of the nation. You can't do anything unless you're healthy. And we know how much money we have to spend when we get sick, Mr. Pre we don't want to get sick. We don't want the place to be overrun with garbage. We don't want a place to be overrun with rodents. And when it's overrun with garbage, it breeds rodents, Mr. President. We heard of so many diseases that mosquitoes spread. We don't want a place to be overrun with mosquitoes. And that is why this piece of legislation is now speaking about the overgrown pieces of land, is now speaking about the derelict vehicles, is now speaking about the, the uh, dilapidated buildings. Mr. President, I am so happy with this piece of legislation. And I am hoping that we're not just here to pass this legislation for style, you know. 
I want enforcement. We want enforcement of this legislation. I want within a month, somebody is taken to the magistrate's court and have to pay $25,000 for indiscriminate dumping. Are you listening to me, Mr. Solid Waste Manager? Because you are on our little ward, you know. So I hope you're listening, because I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you. You got a couple of police officers here. I'm going to call you all too. Right? All who are little wardens are going to call. Members of the board. I'll make myself available. I want to know who the members of the board are. Because I'm going to call. I'm going to, hmm? And I'll call the member opposite yes, too. <laughs> I'm going to call. And I want to throw out a challenge here to all of us who live in Nevis. Because people have called me all the time. And sometimes they will call me and say, Erica, see a truck going down Halley's Road with, with, with garbage. Mm -hmm. We have to encourage our people. We must encourage our people to stop being afraid. If you see a truck pass down with garbage, take the number. Call the manager at Solid Waste or call somebody. Call the police. The police, you are now little wardens too. When we see things going wrong, we should not be afraid to talk. All of us, the health of the nation is for all of us. And so we, all of us, need to ensure that Nevis remains clean and healthy. We want this indiscriminate dumping to stop. They need to stop. They need to stop going on the beaches to dump. They need to stop going on, on people's um, land to dump. In the guts. Oh, yes. That's a major thing. They're dumping in the guts. Mr. President, and so I want that going forward, people can be deterred. And that is why the hefty fines, that is why the hefty fines member opposite. And for you to even suggest that if the fines are too harsh, come on, they should have been harsher. Fines should have been heavier. Because people know when they're doing these things that they know they're wrong. Sometimes they go in the dead of night to dump. Sometimes when they go when they think nobody is looking at them. And they go to all these places where you don't even think they would go. Because when I got the call and said, the person said, Erica went up Saddle Hill. And up, they're dumping up here Saddle Hill. I mean, come on. You would actually go up to Saddle Hill to dump? And people would condone that? Because if, if Madam... Um, Member opposite, if you are saying that the fines are too harsh, you are condoning indiscriminate dumping exactly. indirectly. Exactly. Because if you are saying we shouldn't be charging people to dump indiscriminately, you are saying that they should dump. So I am here, Mr. President, to simply say that we here in Nevis, we should be operating better than that. We didn't grow up like this. We grew up hearing cleanliness is next to godliness. Yes, Let me say it again. Cleanliness is next to godliness. And we are a godly people. We are Christian-minded people. And we should start acting like that. I want, Mr. President to commend the mover of the bill and to commend very highly this piece of legislation. I believe it's a piece of legislation in the right direction, as all have been presented by this caring government. And I want as well to commend very highly the work of the manager and his entire staff at Solid Waste, as I say, I commend them highly. They, they, have been, they have been doing a stellar job in keeping our beautiful island clean. You know how good it feels sometimes, Mr. President, when people visit and say, Nevis, clean? You know how good it feels? I remember one time he had some visitors here on a cruise, and they said, listen, we have been cruising up the islands, and Nevis is the cleanest. You know how good I felt? Well, we want Nevis to remain clean. Clean for us and clean for all who will visit. 
And so with these few words, Mr. President, I commend the mover. I wish this bill safe passage through this honorable house. And may all of us in Nevis continue, continue to show our love and our pride by keeping our environment clean. May it please you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. to wrap up the debate on this very important bill, the Solid, Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority Ordinance Cap 3.03. Mr. President, let me start by first thanking my colleagues who supported me on this very important bill. I thank them because, like clockwork, we emphasized different parts of the bill which were necessary to be emphasized. And so I think that we would have done an excellent job in bringing to the fore the most important and salient parts of the bill. Even though the entire bill in its totality, it is important, we were able to highlight the very important parts that we need persons to be cognizant of and they are to pay, pay attention to. I pay special and particular attention to member of Nevis One who read an excerpt from the IMF, an IMF report. World Bank, sorry, World Bank report. And it, it, it makes me feel so much more important to be a part of this group. The reason being is because we take the time out to do the things that are necessary. And bringing this bill to the House today to have its final reading and hearing what he would have read from the World Bank suggests that Nevis is forward-looking. Yes. We are in a good place. We are in a good position. Imagine from that same report, there are bigger countries, more industrialized countries who are bigger than us, who are lagging. We are ahead of the game. And so it is important that we applaud ourselves and applaud our efforts for bringing such a forward-looking piece of legislation to the House today. Mr. President, I want to re-emphasize something that the other supporter of the bill made mention. Our Nevis, lovely Nevis, our pristine waters, we ought to be a people who are happy and proud of our cleanliness. Of recent time, a particular culture has been seeping into Nevis. That is not our culture no. to have garbage all over the place. No. And so we want to restore Nevis to that place where we were when everybody did their part in keeping Nevis clean. Imagine. You're going to leave the low-lying areas of Gingerland you know, and go up to Saddle Hill to dump garbage. To dump garbage. That is disheartening. It's crazy. It's, 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 it's sick. unfathomable. It's sick. We are not to do that. We are not accustomed to that. And so I want to further reiterate the importance of this bill. Solid waste 
is a very important aspect of public health. There is no public health unless you control solid waste. In order for us to keep people out of Alexandra, the health care must start in the public health, that is at our health centers and in our communities, in our backyards. And so it is important that we bring this bill. Mr. President, I, I, much has been said, and I think that we have indeed brought an excellent ordinance here to be passed today. I want to place on record my thanks to the legal team, Lady Lewis, Madam Lewis, and her team at Legal, who would have given excellent guidance throughout this process. Young Mr. Liebert, thank you very much. He would have come and sat with me and we would have gone through this bill extensively. I want to thank you, Mr. President, because you made a statement. You preempted me. Because I had decided when I come to the podium, I would suggest to the member opposite that it would be good if she can put her questions in writing so I can be able to address them completely. I was writing, I had my two colleagues on either side helping me to keep up, but I ran out of space, I ran out of time, I ran out of even the concentration of keeping up with your questions. So I want to say to you that it would help me and it would make your contribution more meaningful if you were to send me these um, questions and then I can deal with them. What I am happy for, though, is that you would have agreed on a number of, of, of points, and that is commendable coming from you. We are here to debate, but at the end of the day, we are here to find the best fit for Nevis, for the people of Nevis. And so I must thank you for the contributions that you, the contribution that you made and the areas in which you would have um, agreed that we would have done an excellent job. On. So, it, with that said, I will leave the answers until I am sent an official questioning package, and then I can. Up, but um, I really wanted to put this on record in this honorable house that it is prudent for any government, whenever you are introducing a piece of legislation that has to do with health, environmental health, solid waste, the first step really would be to have a consultation session, have a white paper. It is at that point where members of the public, including myself, would be able to ask questions, pose questions, and give comments. Oh, oh. And so, 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 Mr. President, that is the, the normal course of business. But, Mr. President, I take what the mover of the bill have said, and I would be willing to do what she has asked. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, the, if I might add, the, the, this is the second reading of the bill. And so the, when the bill was um, circulated on the first, the first time, it was meant for um, wider perusal and um, input and discussions from you know, the general public, um, Madam, um, opposite, on the opposite side, it would, it would have been good if you would have submitted them. But I still extend that invitation that you. 
that you that you 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 think. But I want just to 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 say something that a bill cannot outline or is not set out to outline every single step and procedure that it, it, it is a generic or more generalized um, document given the scope within which one could operate. And so in as much as um, there might be um, some questions to be answered, this document would then lend itself to the management of the authority being, um, what do you call it? Being, being flexible and being creative in doing the number of things that you would have outlined earlier. And so, Mr. President, I want to say that I am thankful for the discussion that we would have had today. It was a very healthy discussion. And so, with these closing remarks, I want to wish this bill a safe passage through this honorable house. May it please you, Mr. President. The question is that that the, that the bill be read a second time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. A bill to repeal and replace the Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority Ordinance, CAP 3.03, .03, and to provide for the management of solid waste, including its collection, storage, and disposal in conformity with the best environmental practices and for matters related thereto are connected therewith. The bill has been read a second time. Housing Committee. No, you start from the schedule. So, second schedule. The question is that the second schedule do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. First schedule. The question is that the first schedule do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Part 11. The question is that, sorry, go ahead. You, you said it already? Myra. Go ahead, Myra. Part 10. The question is that part 10 do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Part 9. The question is that part 9 do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Part 8. 
The question is that part eight do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Part seven. Question is that part seven do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Part six. The question is that part six do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Part five. The question is that part five do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Part four. The question is part four do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The Yeah. Could you could you say the could you say the second line again for me, please? Part four, as amended, do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. The ayes have it. Part three. Question is that part three, do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Part two. Question is that part two as amended do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Part one. Question is that part one do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Enacting clause. Okay, just before, just before we take up that. Um, are we going to deal with the the schedule uh, the B B schedule no form B and form the forms oh, oh, that, that has to be amended um, D, um, you have president, uh, speaker instead of president. Oh, I see. Okay. 
Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Nocturne clause. The question is that the nocturne clause do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Title. The question is that the title do form part of the bill. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. House resumes the sitting. <coughs> Section fifty seven. Yeah. Mr. President, I rise. To report to this honorable house that the bill shortly entitled Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority Bill 2021 has passed through the committee stage with three amendments. At the same time, Mr. President, to advise that we have received the fiat from the Deputy Governor General since this is a money bill. The said fiat, Mr. President, is available to this honorable house which gives us the permission to deal with this money bill. Also, Mr. President, pursuant to section 54 of the rules of this honorable house, I move that the bill be read a third time and pass. The question is that the bill be read a third time and pass. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. A bill to repeal and replace the Nevis Solid Waste Management Authority Ordinance Cap 3.03 .03, and to provide for the management of solid waste, including its collection, storage, and disposal in conformity with the best environmental practices and for matters related thereto or connected therewith. The bill has been read a third time and passed. The bill passed. Adjournment. I just wanted to say something briefly on the adjournment. <laughs> I, I want to record, uh, place on record my profound thanks to, and that of the administration, to all our valued healthcare workers. They have done an extremely good job in managing the pandemic, and I could not have left here today without saying to them how appreciative we are in the service that they have rendered. We do value their service and we value them because they are doing an excellent job. But as we continue, as they continue to do their part, we have our part to play as well. And as the country opens up to more economic activity, more social activity, it is the onus is on us to pay attention and continue to adhere to the non-pharmaceutical um, protocols, the wearing of masks, the washing and sanitizing your hands, and the social distancing. We at this time, Mr. President, would not want to erode the gains that we would have made. To date, we still only have had 18 cases on Nevis, and we want to keep those numbers as minimal as possible. And so, in closing today's session, I want to say to the healthcare workers, the, those at the um, task force, the team at the hospital, at the flamboyant home, all the orderlies, the security, all those persons who pay a part, have played a part in keeping our numbers down and protecting our health borders, I want to say a huge thank you 
to all of them. May it please you. Mr. President, I rise and seek your leave. Uh, remove the motion for the adjournment of this honorable house, sign and I. Mr. President, I rise to second the motion. The question is that this honorable house be adjourned, sign and I. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. House adjourned.